Okay, so let's uh, get started with our calorimetry session. Uh, welcome everyone. And uh, we will start by Fabio Apaha to talk about the commissioning of the mu calorimeter. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. Yes, I will show you the, the design and the construction status of the mu calorimeter. Uh, the talk outline is as follows. I will touch briefly the measurement overview of the experiment uh, and the technique of the mu experiment. I will show you what are the requirements for the calorimeter and eventually that drove the technical choice and its design. Uh, we'll, we'll indulge a little bit on the calorimeter engineering design and its integration. Uh, I will show you the calorimeter performances as measured in beam tests and prototypes. Uh, and then we will, I will show you the, the, the production status of all the main components that are crystals, photodetectors, front-end and digitizer electronics. I will show you the status of the mechanics, and uh, we will conclude with some assembly, assembly plants uh, that actually are taking place very soon. So briefly, the Mutui experiments aims at the measurement of, of the charge lepton flavor violation process, that is uh, the conversion of a muon into an electron. Here you see bound in, a, in, a, in an atom of aluminum. Here you see the, a picture of what we are looking for. Uh, uh, the, for this process, we have a very clear signature that is provided by the monoenergetic uh, uh, electron conversion that has an energy of the mass of the muon. And the proton beam of Fermilab is going to produce a very high intensity pulse beam of uh, 10 gigahertz uh, of stop muons. The goal is to reach single event sensitivity uh, for order of magnitude, magnitudes better than, than syndrome, two, syndrome 2. Mutui will detect and count the conversion electrons with respect to the standard muon capture. The main background is the standard model decay of the electron bound to the nucleus of aluminum into an electron uh, and two neutrinos. But here you see the spectral distribution of these two processes. Here you see the a, a, a theoretical monoenergetic line and the initial spectrum of the DIO shape. Of course, the resolution effects uh, makes uh, these events uh, 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 entering the signal window. And therefore, we need to, to, to have a very, very good resolution in our detectors. So, from cartoons to reality, uh, the spectrometer of Mu2E is a very complex system of solenoids. We have three main soli three solenoids, the production solenoids, the transport solenoid, and the de de detector solenoids. So the production solenoids, that is, uh, 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 it has a graded magnetic field from 4.6 Tesla to 2.5 Tesla, uh, is, is, uh, 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 is being hit by, by the proton beam that actually hits the, the tungsten uh, road target. In this process, we have a lot of muons, uh, pions produced as secondary particles. These pions are somehow funneled, uh, uh, focused back, uh, thanks to the graded solenoid system, uh, into the transport solenoid, where they eventually decay into muons. They are, these muons are charge and momentum selected. The muons enter the detector solenoid, where they hit the aluminum target, and eventually uh, the, the muon that is stopped into the aluminum converts into an electron. Here you see the helic path uh, of the electrons, the conversion electrons that, that eventually, eventually hits the first the tracker and then the calorimeter. Uh, here I show you the status of the art of the construction of the two, three main uh, uh, um, solenoids, the production solenoid, the transport solenoid, there is the one in better shape, and the, the uh, detector solenoid. So the requirement for the calorimeter is that in this search, the calorimeter has to have redundancy and com complementary qualities uh, with respect to the, the, the king of the detector, that is the, the tracker, the straw tube tracker that has a very, very precise resolution to eventually measure the, the, conversion, elect the conversion electron. So, but the calorimeter is going to, ad to add additional seeds to, to improve track finding. Also, uh, it's capable to reject uh, muons from, from, from electrons, and, uh, and uh, in order to, to, to fulfill these requirements, uh, we, the, the calorimeter has to provide an energy resolution of the order of 10%, time resolution of the order of 500 picoseconds, uh, provide a very good position resolution to, to, to be able to add track finding. Uh, everything is, is in vacuum in, in inside a one, one Tesla magnetic field, and also there is a harsh radiation environment. So, 
here I show you that the reason why these, both the tracker and the calorimeter have a null inside, because we don't want to detect low momentum particles, but we only want to detect particles from 80 MeV to up. Uh, so the technical specification to fulfill the requirements that we just, just uh, 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 talked about are, so we decided to, to build a high granularity crystal calorimeter with CPM readout. So eventually the geometry is going to be two annually to improve the acceptance. Uh, the crystals uh, have to have a very high light yield in order to have the best energy and time resolution. At least we need to have, uh, we evaluated to, to, to have 24 electrons per MeV. Uh, we are going to, 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 to have two CPMs uh, and preamps per crystals. Uh, also the CPMs need to be thermally uh, uh, controlled down to minus 10 degrees in order to reduce eventual uh, 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 radi radiation-induced leakage current. We also need to have fast signal, fast digitization for pile-up disentangling and timing resolution. And the crystal and all the main components in the core of the calorimeter need, needs to withstand a lot of radiation and, and neutron fluence. So eventually, the design of the calorimeter is uh, as, the, uh, as uh, uh, shown in this uh, CAD picture. So we have two, two annuli. Uh, each annular disk is, com is containing 674 undoped CSI crystals with these dimensions. Each crystal, as I said, is read out by a custom-made CPM coupled in air. Uh, uh, of course, the PDA is maximized at the emission, uh, emission light of the, of the crystal. Also, the crystals are uh, Tyvek and Tedler wrap to maximize light yield and minimize the crosstalk. The CPM are glued into these holders and connected to, directly con connected to onboard front end electronics. On top of that, we have uh, uh, 200 mega samples per second digital uh, electronics on custom crates. And, uh, both disks are also instrumented with uh, calibration systems. Is a, there is a radioactive source, uh, Alaba bar, and, and a green laser system that provides absolute and uh, gain monitoring capability. So this is an X-ray, I mean, a, 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 an exploded view of all the components of the calorimeter. We have an outer mon monolithic aluminum supporting disks. Uh, disk, actually for each disk. Then we have an inner uh, low budget material, it's carbon fiber uh, uh, inner ring. And then we have two cover, one, a front uh, cover that is also housing the piping for the source. And also a front end electronic plate that is housing the, the, this holder that has uh, the, 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 the CPMs and the front end electronics. All, all this is instrumented with, it, with cabling and pipes, of course. So, uh, uh, once we froze the, the technology of the calorimeter, we built a module zero uh, prototype that somehow was, uh, is, has actually uh, all the, the, um, the final uh, premises, uh, cho chosen technologies. So, this, this, um, this module zero calorimeter has been tested at the BTF in Frascati. And the energy resolution and timing resolution that we obtained for, for 100 MeV electrons is well in agreement with, uh, with, with the requirements. Uh, here you see uh, FA, wh when we were assembling the crystals, controlling the, the, the moisture, of course. And here is the, the, the module zero sitting in the BTF facility. So these are, these are the results we obtained in the, in the BTF. And so, as you can see, we, we had a very good resolution, energy resolution, ranging from four, 5 to 7 percent, according to the angle we were impinging the, the calorimeter. And the resolution is of the, or, also of the order of 100 picoseconds. So the, so the results fully comply with our requirements, and, and this gave us green light for the purchase of the components. So we started with the most expensive and most long, long, long-standing uh, procurement of, of, of uh, parts that were the crystals and the CPM. So we, we had two producers for the crystals, Sikas and Saint Gobain. As long as the crystals were coming to Fermilab, we were testing them for both for optical and mechanical uh, properties. Unfortunately, Saint Gobain failed to, to match some specification and we needed to, 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 
to give back uh, San Goben tender to Sikas that eventually produce all, most, almost all the crystals. So these are the results for the light yield distribution of the photo for, uh, and, and, and for the crystals and the energy resolution. So oh, the production of the crystals is completed. The CPMs are uh, custom-made Amamatsu CPM, are six individual cells connected as uh, in this sketch. Also for the CPMs, we, we measure uh, br breakdown voltage, uh, dark current, the gain, and we also have irradiated them uh, uh, sampling five, five CPMs per batch. And these are also the results of, uh, of the tests. So we did reject a very, very little number of photosensors. So with the photosensors in our hand, uh, we could uh, assemble this uh, delicate part of the calorimeter uh, that is the readout unit, is, our, is an old photomultiplier. So we are, we are gluing the, 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 the photosensor into this copper holder that also will contain the front-end electronic boards, a Faraday cage, a fiber needle to calibrate each individual crystal. See, here you see some, some uh, uh, the gluing procedure. It was, was a tedious, tedious procedure where we thought of doing a Fermilab, but for, for, COVID, for, for COVID reasons, we had to move everything to, to Frascati shipping back and forth stuff from Fermilab uh, and do the gluing in Frascati. So now we have everything ready and we are assembling and testing these, uh, these readout units. And this is going to be shown by Elisa in her, in her poster. Uh, so the, the CPM signals is fed to this uh, front-end electronic board that consists in a trans-impedance preamplifier, a shaper and a voltage regulator. Then the signal is sent to these uh, 10 DAQ crates where we have, seat, we have mezzanine boards that, that takes care, take care of the slow control distribution and high voltage, low voltage setting. And are paired, as you can see here, to the digitizer that is uh, a, a 200 mega sample per, mega sample, sample per second uh, board with a 12-bit ADC flash, flash, flash ADC. So of course, the sampling is optimized to, for signal reconstruction and pile up uh, disentangling. But Franco will show much more details on this. Uh, as soon as uh, the first board, mezzanine boards and, and, and Dirac, Dirac boards uh, were, were, were being produced, we decided to have a vertical, a calorimeter vertical slice test with Cosmics in Frascati. So we use our vacuum vessel that we built on purpose to test the full uh, functionality of the of the module zero, including the, 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 the ability to cool down in temperature the CPMs. Here we have uh, a crate, a real crate uh, that is housing the mezzanine board and the digitizer. We also uh, use a, 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 a custom made uh, cosmic ray tagger to tag muons. Here you see, and, and Ruben will, will show many more details on this in his poster. Here you see the MIP uh, charge distribution. Here you have a crossing MIP in the, in the calorimeter. Here are some summary of the results. We have a very good uh, level of noise. Then we, our students are, are, are playing around, optimizing the, the, the construction of the template to fit energy and time resolution. Here you see the MIP signal is a very, very robust 400 millivolt signal. And, uh, and uh, we also exercise in T0 finding and uh, here you can see the time distribution, uh, the time resolution uh, obtained with Cosmics that uh, is, uh, gives us a, a cell mean time resolution of around uh, 200 picoseconds. So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's already very good with, with, with MIP. So uh, as I said, we have two calibration tools, a source and a laser system. The source is composed by a neutrons from a DT generator it's coming from Babar, and our Caltech colleagues are taking care of this system. Uh, here I did a fluorine rich fluid uh, that, that is then piped into the front phase that I was showing you. Then uh, the following reaction takes place. Uh, and so what, what happens is that you have uh, six MeV photons uh, hitting the surface of the crystal. Thank you. Uh, and here you can see how well we can calibrate each crystal at the order of 10%. On top of this uh, laser, this source calibration system, we have a laser calibration system. Here you have uh, uh, a, laser, a laser bench uh, with pin diodes for, for monitoring the stability of the laser shine and uh, a, a fiber system to 
and, 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 uh, and in the integration sphere to route the light to each individual channel of the calorimeter. That this, uh, this system is going to, to keep the stability at the level of the percent. So, uh, where we are, this is the mechanical parts procurement. We have all most of the parts, apart from this uh, uh, sandwich that is uh, made of carbon fiber, aluminum, honeycomb, that is a uh, like a pillow where the source pipes is, uh, is embedded that is being built as we speak. I mean, we think of getting it by the end of the month. So we have produced uh, all the feet. We need to assemble them. We have uh, the outer aluminum ring. This is the one that is already at Fermilab. It is waiting to be filled with crystals. We have these two very nice pieces of, 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 of uh, engineering that are the front end electronic plates made in, 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 in peak with all these uh, cooling lines in copper. Then we have the inner ring that was tested, <laughs> stress tested in Frascati with lead, lead loads. And the crates are also ready, as you will see in the next picture, where we exercise with all the mechanical parts that were coming, uh, were produced, and we made some dry fit. So we first uh, pair the, the front end electronic plate to the inner, to the outer aluminum ring. Then we add the, the, the cooling manifolds to the crates. The crates have cooling lines as well. Then we added also the first uh, inner carbon fiber ceiling that is being measured as we speak. Here is a, is a, is a cable mock-up uh, exercise. Here you see people at, at welding the, the pipes. So, as I said, almost everything is ready and we have actually yesterday the first big crate left Frascati to, towards Fermilab. Uh, where we are going to, to, to receive it in, in a couple of weeks. So the conclusions of, of uh, the status of the construction of the calorimeter are, are as follows. So we, we, we think that they mean the technical choice shows a, a good energy resolution and timing resolution, and we tested it. Uh, the most demanding requirement was to operate in the magnetic field, in vacuum, and in rather hard environment. Anyhow, CPM work under neutral radiation, but eventually need to be cooled down. Uh, the engineering of the cooling was, was, uh, was challenging. Uh, so, as I say, the production of the crystal, CPM, front-end electronics is completed. Also, the mechanical part uh, is completed. Uh, the vertical slice test uh, is, uh, is uh, promising, uh, and we are keeping produ producing the digitizer board, and we are shipping the material. So, the plan is to start assembly uh, uh, first, outgassing the components because the components, before getting assembled into the disk, need to be evacuated, not to, 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 to load uh, uh, into the vacuum, uh, uh, the cryostat vacuum. And so we, we, will, we will plan to begin the crystal stacking June, July. And eventually, we will be moving the, the two disks in the Mutui hall by the end of the next year. And then done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Over there. This question there. Thank you for the, the nice overview. Can you say a little more on the cooling? So you, you control the accuracy, or you still need to correct for gain variation with the with yes. temperature? Yes, you, you answer, and you also uh, you ask your question, you also answer it. <laughs> yes, anyhow, we, we, the most delicate part, I mean, the crates, you just have to dissipate the heat produced by the electronics. The complicated part is the thermalization of the CPM. That, that is very complicated. But I mean, the, 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 the heat load is such that they will eventually be stabilized, but we also monitor the temperature and we know how much we should correct uh, for monitor changes, for, for temperature changes. Okay, one more question there. Hi, good morning. Just uh, curiosity. Why the coupling between the CPM and the crystal is made uh, with uh, two millimeter air, I understand? Uh, the best way, yes, that, 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 that's, that's nice. I mean, the best way, it's for, for mechanical reasons, but I mean, the best way would have been to put some optical grease, but we are in vacuum, so optical grease outgasses. So we could have 
connect directly the crystals to the CPM, but then we get back to, the, to this question, because since the CPMs are cooled down, you don't want to no, transfer the, to, to cool down also the crystal. So eventually also the crystals will be cooled down a little bit, but as long as there is no gradient in the temperature along the crystal, that's not a problem. Uh, but it's going to be a dynamic process. I mean, you, you cool down much more fast uh, the, the CPM part uh, and, and the front plate disc, and you want to think about it as detached as possible from the rest of, of the mechanics. Not to, not to have a neat load that is too unbearable. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Thanks to the speaker again. Thank you. <laughs> so our next speaker, Tobin Quest. So let's hear now about the CMS high granularity calorimeter. Yeah, in particular about the timing aspects of this calorimeter. So uh, from Fermilab, we're going back to CERN. And as we've heard already at multiple occasions, the testing of the standard model at CERN will continue until the end of the 30s, beginning of the 40s even. And uh, yeah, currently we have um, accumulated the data set of about corresponding to 4% of what is ultimately accumulated. Now with run three, we want to double that. And then uh, at the end of the 20s, beginning of the 30s, we will have the so-called high luminosity LHC, where we can uh, yeah, ultimately accumulate the data set corresponding to four, up to four inverse Atoban. But before getting to this uh, fantastic data set at the end, we need to first upgrade the, high, uh, the Large Hadron Collider and correspondingly also with it, the LHC uh, experiments. So, uh, in particular, ATLAS, CMS, LHCV, and ALICE. Looking at CMS, there are many upgrades foreseen for before high luminosity LHC, and we have heard yesterday from Alessandro about the tracker. Um, there's also more upgrades for, for instance, the barrel calorimeter for the muon system and others. So, for instance, they're supposed to become a timing detector, for which I've seen a poster. And what's going to happen with the end cap calorimeter? So, this is something very drastic, because the existing end cap calorimeters will really be taken off with the saw and uh, will be replaced with something completely new. And this completely new is this uh, fantastic high granularity calorimeter. Very ambitious project because of its sheer size. Um, a GCAL, it's its abbreviation, it's a, in essence it's a, it's a sampling calorimeter uh, which will have silicon and scintillators as sensitive material. Um, silicon in total we have uh, an area of more than 600 square meters so luckily, we already procured the silicon before the shortage of the semiconductor material worldwide. Um, we have a similar order of magnitude of scintillators, which we will equip in the in outermost region where the radiation uh, levels allow. And yeah, the name-giving feature of HGCAL is the readout, uh, the, the size of the sensitive units. So the size of the sensitive units, in particular in the very forward region, in the silicon region, corresponds to the size of my thumb or you know, my, my uh, small finger. So half a, half a centimeter to a, to a full square centimeter. And yeah, we will have at the end more than six million of channels, which will all give as a function of the position an uh, idea of how much energy has gone through this uh, sensitive unit and ideally also the time, which I will hint at. So uh, the idea is that HGCAL is in fact an imaging calorimeter. So the idea is that you are supposed to be able to see by eye what's sort of happening inside your detector. And here as a, an example, I brought with me a simulated um, Higgs boson created from vector boson fusion. That Higgs boson is supposed to decay into two gammas. Uh, the gamma and the two jet by chance happen to go into the same quadrant of one of the end caps. And you can really see here, for instance, really the jet evolving. This is here in, in, in yellowish. In the, throughout the full layers because it has hydronic components so it goes through the full calorimeter and also the photon you see in the very first layers. All the stuff around is uh, parts of it is still belongs to the signal but most of the things, uh, most of the hits actually uh, correspond to, to pileup. Pileup for high luminosity LHG will, one of, will be one of the most um, drastic challenges that we will have to cope with because currently we have order of 40, 50 pileup interactions per bunch crossing well, at high luminosity LHG, we will have 140 to 200. 
So it will be quite challenging to make sense of you know, what actually happened, what is your interaction of interest that you actually want to analyze. Um, and this is even more, uh, more obvious if you take the same event that, I look, uh, that we looked at before and project all the hits, all the energy into one plane, you really have to look closely to find out what you actually want to, want to see. Of course, you can now make a career out of making sense of all such images uh, by writing dedicated software or using machine learning. and All of this is nice and it works to some degree, but what you also need, you need to have timing. So you need to have like some segmentation in the fourth dimension. And this is also illustrated here in this uh, simulated event. So if you assume you have a timing resolution of uh, 20, 30 picoseconds, and you um, can then reconstruct what the timestamps of these clusters is, which you say, this is my signal. And then you basically select all the hits which are sort of in the vicinity in the time domain with respect to these two clusters. And by this means, you can reject lots of the pileup. So that's basically what timing is there for. Um, at the time of when HECA was proposed and when the technical design report was written a few years ago, um, these, simulation, uh, these studies based on simulation have been done extensively. Um, there, um, a timing resolution of about 20, 30 picoseconds, as I said, was assumed. Um, I do not want to quote too many of these studies because they are, still, they are by now a bit outdated because this, the design of the detector has changed a bit. But um, these two plots are still, um, in my opinion, still hold. So the left plot illustrates nicely the feature that was shown on the slide before. Um, namely, if you um, have a good timing resolution and you cut basically the tails out, you can reject most of these red and blue here, which correspond to the hits of the timing uh, of the pileup. And also you can uh, reject really vertices which do not come from your main vertices, uh, vertex. So here in black, this is it. hits coming from an interaction happening really at the zero, zero of your, of your in interaction of interest. Red are hits from an uh, interaction further away, 10 centimeters. And of course, uh, this uh, then corresponds to a time of light of a few hundreds of picoseconds. And if you have 20 picoseconds of resolution, you can nicely separate that. Another prediction which was done at this, uh, at this time is that you should have at the order of 10 to 100 hits with a timestamp at the end. And if you combine these timestamps for let's say a cluster, so for a single particle, you should have an order of 10% um, at uh, not 10 picoseconds resolution for full showers and, and timing. So this is what you, what you can expect still. Um, achieving such a resolution is not trivial at all because you have all sorts of sources um, where, sort of, uh, in, uh, where sort of the resolution can, can degrade. And it starts obviously with a silicon sensor. Um, so the signal formation in the sensor that you're using should be fast enough. And this has been studied for our silicon sensor prototypes in test beam already in 2016, 17. And there we could demonstrate that the asymptotic res time resolution for silicon is, uh, for our silicon sensors is indeed 10 picoseconds. Um, then you have many contributions from the actual, um, from the actual readout ASIC, from the readout electronics. So you have a term from the preamplifier, you have time walk, you have the TDC binning, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, all of this is um, most likely dominating your time resolution. And in fact, getting a good ASIC that is able to get your time resolution is, is key. Of course, another aspect is um, yeah, the clock distribution, which can also then sort of deteriorate your uh, time resolution. And uh, maybe in 10 years from now, there will be, my, uh, there will be another person uh, who can talk about talk to you about how this was actually controlled and how this was calibrated in the final system. What I can tell you today is how we did this in the test beam uh, by now four years ago, so one year before Corona. So what we tested at the end of 2018 was a prototype system from HECA where we had a prototype readout ASIC, the so-called Skyrock 2 CMS. The Skyrock 2 CMS had a um, yeah, prototype circuit for the time of arrival measurement, for the timing measurement. Uh, basically, um, you had there a fast shaper followed by a discriminator, and then you had a block which then converted the time to an amplitude, and this amplitude then gave you an insight of when the incidence of the time was. Um, yeah, what we knew from characterizing this chip beforehand is that we could expect an order of 50 picoseconds time resolution for this chip. And as I said, we have uh, constructed modules uh, with these chips, with prototype silicon modules, um, we have already published some of these results. 
And one of the unpublished results yet is something that I will have here. That's the uh, validation of the timing performance of the system. Um, so what we used for um, measuring the timing and for calibrating the system was a reference detector, reference timing detector, as we have seen also yesterday, and also various posters, these microchannel uh, micro plates. In our case, we had their contribution of about 30 picoseconds. So this is what one should, of course, keep in mind when measuring such a thing. So this is here an illustration of what sort of timing information we had available at the test beam, and this can also be to some extent representative to what will be in the final system. So we had here the uh, microchannel plate system, which gave us the, the waveform, and with a simple waveform analysis, we could then extract the time with respect to the, to the clock. Then, um, you know, the, show, the particle propagated further through the detector, eventually reached uh, the, the individual readout channels, where it was then triggering the TUA, the time of arrival ramps, until the next rising and falling clock edges. And then the, you know, the strategy is, was simply for the calibration to compare the um, timestamp from the MCP with, you know, the TOA and all its, uh, the reconstructed energy of each readout channel. And uh, what you then end up with, up with is a two plus one uh, calibration procedure. So the first step is obviously the calibration of the TOA. In this case, we have a nonlinearity because of the uh, TAC ramp up. Then uh, the second, so and here the order is of course 25 nanosecond, um, you know, covering the full clock period. The uh, second term is also what was expected because we have a constant threshold discrimination is the time walk, which in our case, you know, this is here 3.5 nanoseconds, that's, that's the scale. So we have orders of na one nanoseconds here, the, that's the scale. And then the last um, term, which was a bit unexpected and which illustrates the importance of doing such test beams and such prototype tests was actually um, a correlation of the time with the total energy this wa that was deposited in one of these modules, which we interpret as a sort of uh, you know, baseline shift, which then affects the time, um, the, record, the measured time. And this is also at the order of hundreds of picoseconds, is what we saw in the data. Um, but yeah, if we, then we, may, we had enough data, so enough uh, uh, statistics to calibrate at the order of hundreds of, of readout channels, and having all of these uh, Calibrated, we could for the first time make such nice event videos. So we can really make videos of how, in our case, a positron goes through the detector. And this is here illustrated in three time frames. So this is here um, the first 400 picoseconds, the second 400 picoseconds, and the last 400 picoseconds. And also color coded is also here the order of when these hits were created. And you can really see by looking closely, you can, you can really see this video feature. <laughs> Um, so this is quite nice. So looking a bit more detailed in uh, what we have measured here in terms of the timing performance. So by comparing the uh, timestamps from representative readout channels to the MCP, we are getting sort of at the order of 70 picoseconds at a reference energy of 800 MIPS. So that's um, an intermediate energy, which is representative for 300 GV positron shower. Um, if we compare the um, timestamps between two readout channels, having multiple or so that you can do this exercise, you actually get a bit better. And you also see that readout channels from the same module also seem to be correlated, which was also not really expected, but it's not, not too bad. It's not too surprising because you have the same sort of phase space of your calibration. Anyway, so there's a small discrepancy between, you know, what you get here by comparing channels to channels and channel to the MCP, uh, 70 to 55 picoseconds. And we attribute this feature to uh, you know, a global global jitter between the um, AGCAL or prototype readout system and the system which uh, read out the MCPs and where we injected the copy of the clock. Um, we were not, unfortunately, we were not able to reproduce this feature, but we are quite confident that this is the case, and you can see it quite nicely here. Uh, here. So what you're seeing here in each bar is for each readout, for each shower that went through the prototype, the distribution of timestamps with respect to the MCP, and you can see that the timestamps themselves, they're quite consistent with each other in HEK, and they are commonly shifted with respect to the MCP. So that really hints at the presence of such a global jitter, which is, you know, between these two, uh, between the main system and the reference system. Um, quantifying this a bit further, what we can do here is we can um, compute global 
shower timestamp. So by combining all the hits from the shower and comparing it to the MCP, this is here shown the distribution of this exercise is shown in blue. You get then to a resolution of about 56 picoseconds. And if you do the same sort of exercise, but only taking odd and even layers, so always 14 layers of your prototype, and compare these two timestamps, you know that you get to a resolution of about 36 picoseconds. And by then doing a bit of algebra and considerations of how these resolutions can come up, um, we are sort of confident that this global jitter uh, is amounts to about 50 picoseconds. Yeah? And if we then uh, take this global jitter and we subtract it from our, from our data, um, we get really to a shower timestamp resolution of less than 200 picoseconds. And the good thing is, if this is another cross-check, we are able to reproduce this feature uh, in Monte Carlo by injecting by what we think is the true channel resolution. So that is quite nice. Uh, so 20, less than 20 picoseconds resolution, and uh, you also need to, of course, always show your bias, so how far you are systematically off at the given shower energy. And here, except for this uh, low energy point at, uh, I think this is 20 GV, we are well within 10 picoseconds. So 20 plus 10, so that makes, that's, uh, this, that explains the title of the talk. That gives you about 30 picoseconds timing performance, let's say. So as I said, this was for prototype ASIC. Um, we are currently in the phase of uh, finalizing the design of the ultimate ASIC. This will be the so-called HEC rock. And, um, yeah, this HEC rock will have a completely different um, TDC, a completely different way of reading out the time of arrival. Um, and yeah, the good news is that there have been um, um, lab laboratory tests already with this uh, newest design, the so-called version three. Uh, the time walk is still as expected. And uh, the resolution that was measured for this particular chip is not 50 picoseconds as it was for the Skyrock 2 CMS but in fact uh, only 13 picoseconds, so about three to four times better than it. And of course, what uh, will have to be done in the next months or years um, is to build full modules with these HTC rock, um, test them ideally also with, also with particle beam, beam and sort of repeat this exercise as I've shown here today, and hopefully we'll see an even better resolution then. But I think uh, overall it's quite encouraging, but at the end I'm not able to give you a conclusion, but only a summary. So uh, HECA will use silicon as a sensitive material, but silicon you can also do timing measurements. So you will be able to ultimately have a four-dimensional energy measurement with this colorimeter. And uh, this timing resolution is important to suppress pileup. That's what we're going to use it for. You can also use it yeah, to identify the timestamps of uh, clusters and potentially use it in analyses. Um, but this I'm not so sure about yet. Um, and yeah, in test beam, we have demonstrated the resolution of 20 picoseconds with a bias of less than 10 picoseconds uh, for electromagnetic showers. And the final ASIC, the HEC rock, uh, the prototyping is now finished, and the laboratory tests indicate that it's even better in terms of the timing performance. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our questions? Just as a curiosity, I mean, uh, all these corrections are really complicated in general, but also since you have millions of channels, what is yeah. your strategy of <laughs> calibrating, the, for example, the T-zeros and check them out during the data taking? I'm a f so for the test, then that's what we have to do. Right, yes. but for the experiment, do you have a strategy? Because 10 picosecond is going to be a number. Yeah, for calibration. Uh, I do not have a, I cannot have give you a definite answer on that, but it will be definitely challenging, yes. More yes, questions? Sir. Okay. Uh, there is a pre pre pretty high probability that pile-up hits would uh, overlap with signal hit in, in one cell, right? So to which extent uh, the timing resolution would degrade because of background of pile-up uh, contribution which, is, which precedes the signal contribution in a particular cell? Um. Well, this I cannot tell you definitely, but I can tell you that all these consideration was included in the simulation studies. Um, but I mean, if you have later, if you have pileup coming a bit later, 
and the, the first signal, the interesting signal comes first. That's what you're measuring because you're really measuring the rise time of the signal. So I'm not sure if it really degrades that. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Well, yeah, so, so essentially the timing is matched by, uh, by, the, fr by the front, right? Yes. And so if there are two, uh, two, two signals, then there is one small signal and then a big, uh, and then your signal. Mm -hmm. And the system could, uh, could be triggered by the first small pulse. Yes, exactly. Right. And this would degrade the, uh, the types. Actually, well, if the pileup comes see. later, I don't see why it would degrade, but okay. we, are well, we can take this offline, yeah. maybe. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like a big project to simulate that. Uh, more questions? Is it your fault that there is no more silicon on the market? <laughs> <laughs> Might be that we contributed to it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thanks, the speaker again. Okay, so now we will uh, hear about shower acceleration in oriented crystal scintillators by Laura Bandiera, I believe. Okay. okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm Laura Bandiera from INFN Ferrara, and I will speak about uh, uh, some measurement we have done with the oriented crystal scintillator that uh, I think are very interesting. So uh, this work uh, um, was done uh, inside uh, a small INFN experiment financed by the Commission 5 of INFN. It's called STORM, uh, that stays for strong crystalline electromagnetic field and involve uh, some Italian team and we have external collaborators across the world. I will briefly introduce what is a strong crystalline field and uh, how uh, in uh, such field uh, the electromagnetic shower is modified. Some experimental tests we have done on latent state uh, sample with 100 GV electrons at CERN SPS and possible application in ultra-compact electromagnetic calorimeter for high energy and astroparticle physics. So in a crystal lattice, you can always recognize some strong uh, direction. And what happens if an electron interact, uh, um, so the trajectory of an elect electron is aligned with some particular crystal axis. So it suffers a series of correlated collision with the atom in the same row. So you can replace the field, electric field of single atoms with a continuous string. And the results is a modification of the dynamics of the electrons that can be, for instance, channeled around uh, a crystal axis. But uh, also this modification of the dynamics modify the emission of uh, Bremsstrahlung radiation. This was discovered many years ago, for instance, for uh, 50 um, MeV electrons. We can see here the standard Bremsstrahlung uh, spectrum. Uh, but uh, uh, when uh, the um, electron trajectory is aligned with some particular uh, direction in the diamond, we see an announcement of the radiation in the soft part of the spectrum. But what happens if the electron has an ultra-relativistic energy in a reference frame that is moving with the longitudinal velocity of the particle, the electric field of the string is Lorentz contracted and so the effective field felt by the electron can be very high, in particular since the axial field in uh, uh, high dense crystal can be very high, 10 to the 11 volt on centimeter, for all the lengths of the crystals. So at beam energy already above 10 GeV, uh, the uh, uh, field, the effective field felt by the electron can reach the critical Schwinger QED field, 
10 to the 16 Volton centimeter, above which the electrodynamics becomes nonlinear. But what does it mean in crystals? So because usually this field are in magnetars, can be found in heavy ion collider, interaction with strong laser or linear collider. But in crystal already at uh, accessible energy, uh, 10 GV for uh, tungsten crystal, 100 GV for instance for germanium crystals, what happens? So, so these, are th these are the results of uh, 120 GV electrons interacting with the uh, 3 mm germanium crystals. This is the energy loss measured with the calorimeter. So in case of randomly oriented germanium crystal, you have the standard Bremsstrahlung spectrum. Uh, so peak uh, around zero and decrease with energy. But when the crystal is oriented uh, along the strongest axis of germanium, the 110, uh, you see an announcement of the energy loss peak around 95 GV. So basically, in a very short crystal compared to the radiation length of germanium, most of the particle has lost most of their energy. So uh, you have a strong increase in the radiated energy and also in the uh, energy of the photon emitted that becomes harder and harder. So it's like having a germanium crystal with a reduced radiation length. So you have a decrease of the radiation length that uh, becomes uh, more and more shorter depending on the initial particle energy. But which is the angular? How uh, I have to be precise in the alignment with the crystal. Not so much so, not so uh, much so, uh, because the angular range uh, is around, uh, goes from few milliradians, but you can see an effect even around one degree. So it's not so small, it's not microradians. Uh, and what is important is that the angular range does not depend on particle energy, but only on the type of chosen crystal, so the depth of the material and of the chosen axis. But not only Bremsstrahlung is announcement, but also per production. So uh, these are the results of very high energy photons interacting uh, in an oriented um, tungsten crystal. So you can see that uh, as a function of the energy, you have an announcement of per production. Uh, that is uh, quite macroscopic, uh, and altogether, you basically are accelerating the electromagnetic shower. Uh, so, because you are effectively reducing the radiation length, that this reduction is dynamic uh, during the shower because it always depends on the particle energy, on the photon energy, on the electron and positron energy. But so basically. Um, a particle that interacts with uh, a crystal uh, detector uh, in which uh, the crystal are not oriented, you have uh, uh, a standard development of the shower. But if you orient uh, the very same crystal, commercial crystal, you can reduce the length of the shower, making the uh, calorimeter more compact, the detector more compact, with respect of the state of the art detector. So you can uh, contain the shower of particle above 100 GV in a much shorter length. Uh, you can have a cost reduction uh, and uh, in particular, you can find interesting application of this uh, effect. But uh, what I want to keep in mind is that uh, this happens in commercial available crystals. So in your calorimeters, if for some reason, so isotropic calorimeter, for some reason a particle uh, uh, is aligned uh, uh, at some point uh, in with the crystal axis, these effects occur. So one has to keep in mind that crystals are always crystals. We cannot treat them as amorphous. So we started our investigation uh, choosing uh, a very uh, a quite known and cheap uh, high Z uh, uh, scintillator, so let and state used for a CMS calorimeter and many other experiments. And we chose them also because it has a very simple uh, uh, crystal structure. It's a tetragonal uh, structure. Um, two axes are the strongest one, uh, A and B. And C is a bit weaker, but is also strength. And the strong fish threshold is around 30 GV. But you can always have some effect even uh, below. But uh, already 30 GV, this effect uh, is uh, macroscopic. Uh, and we tested the three different samples, uh, 
Uh, one is uh, 0.45 radiation lens, one radiation lens, and two radiation lens. So we did uh, a series of test beam at uh, extracted line of CERN SPS with 120 GV electrons and positrons. So the energy means that we are in full, full strong field regime for uh, this kind of crystal. So we have uh, the beam, uh, two silicon detector uh, to measure the incoming divergence and track the particle. Uh, the crystal is coupled to photomultiplier, silicon photomultiplier and mounted on a high precision goniometer to orient the axis uh, with the beam. S then we have a multiplicity counter and a bending magnet to sweep away the primary and the secondary charged particles and only the neutral photon uh, signal arrive at an electromagnetic calorimeter. So we started our investigation uh, with the um, 40 millimeter long uh, uh, crystal al uh, oriented along the 001 uh, crystal axis. And we see what we already have seen with germanium, a strong announcement uh, in the energy loss measured by the electromagnetic calorimeter. Keep in mind that uh, how it is done this setup, uh, the energy lost in a secondary particle emitted inside the crystal cannot be measured by the calorimeter. So this is only the neutral signal. And uh, we couple the crystal with commercially available silicon photomultiplier and we measure directly the announcement of the light output. That you see it pick at, at the double with respect to the randomly ori orientation, that is a blue one, and in axial orientation is a red one. So this is basically uh, a demonstration that the shower is accelerated because you are measuring the announcement of the secondary inside uh, the uh, scintillator. Uh, we tried to uh, do simulation because, you know, in GEM4 all the materials are amorphous, even if they are not amorphous. We, in the past, developed a full simulation code based on bayer kakov method to treat uh, uh, radiation effect uh, in any kind of field, uh, take into account the quantum effect of strong field, uh, and we try to insert this full Monte Carlo, rescaling the physics list for gram strallon and pair production inside the Gen 4. It's not a simple way, so it's not so simple, but we obtain a good agreement uh, with our experimental result. Through simulation, we can extrapolate the uh, all the information uh, because, as I told you, all the charged particles do not arrive at the calorimeters. Uh, but with true simulation, I can extrapolate everything. And for the primary beam, it's like having a crystal with, with the 1.6 millimeter radiation length, so a reduce of a factor of five for uh, the primary particle of the radiation length. And uh, we obtain a ratio for the light output. Uh, that is 2.2, that is fully compatible for what we measure with the silicon photomultiplier. Then, uh, in 2021, we did a second uh, series of test beam with the other two uh, samples of one and two radiation lens, chosen the strong and axis this time. One uh, was given us by the EMP of Minsk, and it's uh, the, um, uh, a PVO2 that is uh, doped with molybdenum is the one chosen for the Panda calorimeter. The other one is commercially available from the Moltec company in Berlin. And we couple with a different board of silicon photomultiplier. So for the sample of one uh, radiation length, we did a measurement uh, with the calorimeter at different uh, axial to beam orientation, try to find the range of the effect. So this is random orientation uh, the measure at the, the radiated energy measured at the calorimeter, and the blue curve is axial orientation, and uh, this is uh, 0 0.5 milliradians, 1 milliradians, uh, 2 milliradians, but you always see also see something different from random at 8 milliradians. 8 milliradians is half of a degree. So the range is small, but as I told you, not so small. The peak of axial uh, case is smaller than in the case of uh, uh, 0 0.45 radiation lens because more charged particles are produced and does not arrive at the calorimeter. So we uh, started to do simulation with the thick uh, crystal 
uh, trying to also insert the mosaicity of the crystal because this is not silicon, this is not perfect. So we measure the mosaicity of the sample that is less than one milliradian, so it's good. And we included it also in the Jan4 package. And we see a good agreement with simulation so we can start to do prediction of what could be um, uh, in, in future. So we have to uh, fully finalize this package to in future to do prediction of what would be the results of a calorimeter made of oriented crystal. Then uh, we see again the announcement of the signal of the, the silicon photomultiplier and in this case the action to random ratio is 2.5 and we made the same for the uh, two radiation length uh, uh, crystals and we obtain a, a factor of three of announcement. So it's clearly the shower is accelerated and uh, uh, in macroscopic crystals. So even if they are not uh, perfect crystals, uh, they behave quite good uh, in uh, this direction. Possible application of an ultra compact calorimeter made of oriented scintillators can be in fixed target experiment that are intrinsically forward. So you usually have a uh, uh, few milliradians of uh, range. In dark matter, search to realize compact active beam dump with increased sensitivity to light dark matter. In astroparticles, so you can point a telescope toward the source and reducing the volume needed to contain the shower uh, started by gamma rays above 100 GV. And keep in mind that uh, if you are not in pointing strategy, your calorimeter still works in standard weight. So, uh, so it's not zero one. So if you are not pointing, uh, it's even worse because this is a Fermilab tower. You see there is a, um, uh, you have a calorimeter made of crystal and you can think to orient them. We are uh, investigating the possibility to make a small angle calorimeter for the clever experiment proposed uh, uh, as a successor of an ACC2 at North Area at CERN to investigate uh, the decay of K long in Pi Zero Nunu Bar. Uh, you have, uh, with the small angle calorimeter that has uh, a range, angular range of few milliradians, uh, to uh, reconstruct uh, uh, the Pi Zero coming from this decay while any extra photons coming from the decay, for instance, of K-long in pi zero, pi zero, be vetoed with very high efficiency while maintaining sensitivity to more than 500 megahertz of uh, neutral hadrons. Uh, you can, so you need uh, the ratio between radiation lens and nuclear interaction lens as small as, as possible. So you can use oriented crystal to reduce its zero while doing nothing to nuclear interaction lens uh, and uh, you need excel excellent time resolution so you can use Cherenkov without. Possibility are latent state, but also we are investigating a pure Cherenkov that is um, uh, PBF2 uh, crystals. And uh, we can think about uh, a matrix of uh, crystal in which you need only the first few radiation lengths oriented because it's at the beginning that the shower, when the energy of the particle is maximum, uh, the shower is strongly accelerated by this effect. So we introduced briefly the strong crystalline field and uh, how the shower is accelerated in axial oriented crystal scintillator. And this has been done uh, tests with commercially available sample. So this effect is macroscopic and uh, uh, we measured the uh, announcement of light emission with crystal thickness and compare with Monte Carlo in which we modified the physics list in Gen 4. So there could be possible application in particle and extraparticle physics like pointing strategy, high energy gamma telescope, beam dump and fixed target experiment like the clever small angle calorimeter that is the most straightforward now that uh, we are collaborating uh, inside it. But future work is test of Cherenkov material to uh, realize ultra compact and ultra fast calorimeter, assemble it and test a full calorimeter, not single uh, crystal, and to uh, evaluate fully the performances in terms of uh, radiation length reduction and uh, uh, if the molar radius is modified and so on. Uh, develop a full package uh, in Jan 4 in which you can include uh, the crystal structure of your uh, uh, material 
and now we started a, a global fellowship uh, about this uh, to include inside jump for uh, this possibility and after this work in the next year we hope then ultra compact and uh, if possible ultra fast electromagnetic calorimeters could realistically become fundamental detectors for future high intense and high energy physics experiment so thank you for the attention Thank you very much. Question? Thank you. Very interesting talk. Uh, I have one question to your, your measurements of the different light yield in axial and random direction. How do you ensure that there's no difference in light collection for the different geometries which would then influence your, your, your light yield measurements. It, it, it different geometry. What does you, you turn your crystal, right? But it's not so. Uh, it's not so microscopic because you, if you're at two degree, you don't see this effect. So there is no such a big. Uh, cannot be explained, but the big uh, difference in uh, the. So because at two degree, the effect uh, the disappear the basically. Okay. So uh, you see an effective X0, which is much reduced. Does this also translate to reduced Mollier radius? I think, no, I, I, uh, in our simulation, I think not. Because uh, um, basically does not affect uh, the uh, small energy secondary particles. So they yeah, but you have more high energy particles, so the core should be narrow. Yes, so we believe that the Molière radius remain more or less the same, but no measurement has been done. And this is as I, as that is why I said uh, we need to understand this. But uh, we feel in our simulation, including the full uh, uh, Monte Carlo, yeah. but of course to put something inside giant, uh, it is better to control. Uh, so we want to measure this. This is the next step. More questions? So thanks, Laura. Uh, do you understand, do I understand correctly that you don't use the crystal to measure the energy, but you use a different calorimeter to measure the energy? Uh, the you just uh, rotate it a little bit, and this has an enhancement in Bremsstrahlung that you measure with an independent Yes, uh, instead the light shield, we measure directly cap into the crystals, and we are finalizing simulation to see which is the deposited energy, to connect the ADC signal to deposited energy. But uh, we feel that uh, the next measurement we are planning is to have a calorimeter around uh, the crystal. So put in one of the sample inside a matrix, uh, so it's covered by all the other crystals. So, so this in is principle, yeah, you could use that as an alignment tool. I mean, yes. You, you connect something else, then you rotate, and where you have the peak on the other. Yes, that's the area. idea that we already have like a... a three uh, times three matrix of lit and state uh, coming from CMS and uh, cup and put in one of these crystals at the first uh, and to rotate and so we have the full measurement uh, right. so. thank you okay <coughs> uh, so then I think we can thank the speaker again Okay, so uh, next speaker is Anna Stamela about the uh, uh, calorimeter for a muon crater. So, hi everyone, I am Anna Stamela, a PhD student at the University of Bari. And I will show you some of the preliminary results uh, I got, uh, that we got in a simulation uh, for uh, an MPGD-based uh, calorimeter for a Moon Collider. So I will uh, uh, start with an in a brief introduction on the Moon Collider uh, motivations. Then uh, I will uh, uh, talk about the beam induced background that is one of the main uh, challenge uh, at uh, a Moon Collider experiment. Then I will uh, um, talk about our proposal for uh, Adronic uh, Calorimeter and the R&D that is uh, ongoing, and then sh show some of the results uh, of uh, the simulation. 
So uh, the Moon Collider has a great potential, so both in terms uh, of discovery and precision machine. In fact, uh, the European strategy for particle physics uh, um, indicated it as one of the crucial tools for the development of the high energy physics. Uh, this is because uh, muons can probe uh, multi-TV energy range for discovery of new physics, and uh, um, uh, this because uh, uh, they do not suffer uh, of synchrotron radiation at these energy values, and all the beam energy is available to the collisions. So, for example, in the plot uh, on the top, uh, you can see a sort of comparison between a proton collider and a muon collider, and in particular, uh, um, a pro for a proton collider to reach the same uh, uh, pair production cross-section for every particle, uh, we need to have uh, an, a center of mass energy of around 100 TV, whereas for a moon collider, we, um, it's enough uh, around 14 TV. Uh, besides, uh, on the bottom plot, uh, you can see that uh, X production is, uh, uh, the, the X particles are produced uh, copiously, and therefore uh, a moon collider experiment can be, um, uh, can mm, give uh, precise measurements uh, in the X sector. So an experiment at the Moon Collider has the basic structure of any other uh, experiment at uh, um, colliders. So there is a tracking system very close to the uh, interaction point, then uh, um, an uh, electromagnetic calorimeter followed by an hadronic calorimeter, a uh, magnetic field uh, um, provided by a superconducted solenoid, and the Moon system on in the outer layers. The current proposal for the HCAL consists of a sampling uh, calorimeters made of uh, uh, 60 layers of steel and plastic scintillating tiles. Our proposal will consist in replacing the um, active layer with uh, micro pattern gas detectors. Uh, one of the main differences with respect to other uh, experiments uh, relies in the uh, shielding nozzles uh, that are uh, shown in this uh, figure. Um, that are very close to the interaction points and they are needed to mitigate uh, the beam induced background. In fact, for example, uh, uh, from the simulation, we see that uh, a photon flux of around 7.5 kHz per centimeter squared is expected at the surface of HCAL. However, for more uh, details on uh, the experiment at the Moon Collider, you can uh, have a look at uh, Massimo Casarsa's talk uh, that he gave on Monday. So uh, the beam induced background uh, um, is due to the muons, uh, to the decay of the muons of the beam, and in particular to the interaction of uh, the decay product uh, with the machine elements and uh, uh, the, detector, uh, the, the detector of the experiment. And this uh, const const constitutes the main source of background. The main uh, kinematic properties are uh, um, uh, summarized in these three plots. So uh, they, in general, beam particles have low momentum, uh, a displaced origin with respect to the interaction point uh, and an asynchronous arrival time to the, to the detect with respect to the bunch crossing. Uh, this is because, of course, uh, the, uh, the mm, this is due to the muons decaying before reaching the interaction point. Uh, therefore, uh, since uh, we can actually exploit this characteristic in order to um, reject uh, the background by using, for example, detectors that uh, uh, have high granularity and high, en high time resolution. This is, for example, uh, these are, for example, one of uh, some of the requirements for the uh, hadronic calorimeter at a moon collider. In particular, since uh, uh, high radiation is expected uh, uh, to, to the HCAL, we need uh, a, a technology that is radiation hard that uh, can be produced uh, in small size uh, in order to offer high granularity and therefore uh, high energy resolution for the particle reconstruction and also a fast response to discriminate and to reject the background. Um, therefore, uh, besides uh, uh, giving uh, energy information on the particle uh, that the particle released uh, inside the calorimeters, we also need spatial and time coordinate for the reconstruction with, uh, uh, with the particle flow algorithm. So uh, our proposal will uh, uh, consist in uh, uh, using uh, MPGD uh, for the active layers uh, because they are gas detectors, so they are robust, uh, intrinsically robust against radiations. They can be produced in small size and offer high granularity, and they have uh, a low cost with respect to other technologies uh, so that they can instrument uh, large areas of the experiment. Uh, micro pattern gas detectors has, uh, uh, also the, um, um, offer also high rate capability and good energy and time resolution and they use uh, environmental friendly, friendly gas mixture. 
uh, among the MPGDs, uh, the, mo the best candidates are the state-of-the-art uh, resistive micro well and micromegas because they, also, um, they can also uh, mitigate the effect due to the discharge in the gas. So, um, for example, uh, uh, in micro well and resistive micromegas, uh, the, the latest development uh, have shown that uh, they uh, can mitigate uh, the discharge in due to the high rate environment, but still um, having, uh, have a high rate capability. In particular, the gain stability has been tested up to 10 megahertz per centimeter squared for the micro well and 1 megahertz per centimeter squared for the, for the micro megas. Uh, besides, uh, the MPGD uh, uh, offers uh, uh, high spatial resolution and time resolution. So now coming to the uh, design of the, of the HCAL, uh, we follow the strategy that uh, starts with the simulation in Gen4 in order to study uh, the response to the hadronic showers. And in particular, in this talk, I will show you uh, some results on the shower containment and on the energy resolution obtained with the digital readout. Then uh, the parameters uh, of the simulation uh, will be uh, implemented uh, in the um, simulation of the, in the software of the, of the Moon Collider in the context of the full apparatus in order to study uh, the impact on the particle reconstruction with the full apparatus. And then uh, we will build an HCAL, uh, a real uh, cell prototype, and uh, its performances will be measured in a test beam campaign. So for the uh, Gen4 simulation, uh, we implemented the geometry that is uh, sketched uh, here. It consists uh, uh, in layers uh, made of two centimeters of iron for the absorber and uh, five millimeter of uh, pure argon for the active gap to um, uh, simulate the MPGD. Then each active layer is uh, uh, divided into cells of one by one centimeter qu squared to give the granularity. The, um, the shower response uh, is studied uh, using pion guns uh, with uh, different uh, energies uh, and uh, using the physics list, uh, one of the physics list uh, that is uh, uh, optimized for the hadronic showers. Then we try to optimize uh, uh, the geometry by varying the number of layers uh, and the transversal dimensions of the calorimeter, trying to uh, contain as much as possible uh, the, the shower. In this plot, for example, uh, you can see uh, the containment, uh, the longitudinal containment uh, expressed uh, in a fraction of average deposited energy as a function of the depth uh, uh, of the longitudinal depth of the, of the calorimeter expressed uh, in terms of nuclear interaction lengths uh, for, uh, different, for three different uh, values of the pion energy. And in particular, you can see uh, that uh, uh, the 19% of the energy is contained within uh, around 14 uh, nuclear interaction lengths uh, that corresponds to uh, almost 100 layers in our geometry. And uh, I, uh, I uh, just want to point out also that the 80% of the energy is contained within 50 layers of the calorimeter, that is around 7.5 nuclear interaction lengths, uh, because just because the energy resolution studies are, are performed in this uh, configuration. The same study has been performed uh, for the lateral containment, in particular, um, considering the uh, fraction of energy deposited in cylinders uh, of increasing radius uh, centered uh, on the beam direction, on the pion direction. And here the fraction of energy deposited is expressed as a function of the radius of the cylinders uh, in units of nuclear interaction lengths uh, for different uh, values of the pion energy. Uh, here again, the 90, um, almost the 19% of the energy is contained within uh, three lambda, uh, three nuclear interaction lengths. So before going to the energy resolution study, I just want to stress the fact that uh, this uh, uh, study has been performed uh, with a digital, uh, simulating a digital readout. So uh, the, uh, the, the active layer has been divided into cells of one by one centimeter squared, and we defined one heat as uh, uh, one cell where the deposited energy is uh, higher than 30 electron volts. That is more or less uh, the ionization potential of the argon. Um, in this way, uh, the heat have all, the, all have the same weight, so we do not distinguish between high energy and low energy heat, but this is one of the future plans uh, that uh, we are uh, going to, to, to perform. Uh, so, once we define the uh, heat, we count the number of heat for each uh, value of the pion energy, and uh, um, from the distribution of the number of heat, we uh, extract the uh, mean value. Then uh, we plot uh, the number of it as a function of the pion energy in order to find uh, the calorimeter response function. 
And then uh, from the uh, inverse response function, we reconstruct uh, the energy distribution uh, in order to extract, uh, uh, again, the mean value and the sigma of the distribution. And then we get the energy resolution parameters uh, by fitting uh, a stochastic term, so a convolution of stochastic term with a constant term to the simulated data. So uh, in the plot on the, um, on the left, uh, you can see an, uh, some examples of uh, uh, number of its distribution for different value of the pion energies. Uh, uh, these uh, uh, distributions have been fitted with the Gaussian uh, um, function, and the number of its has been extracted and plotted as a function of the pion beam on the um, right plot. The response function has been fitted with different uh, uh, empirical uh, functions, uh, in particular power laws and logarithmic laws, and uh, um, we choose the ones that uh, offer the best performances for the energy resolution. Uh, here uh, on the left, you can see an example of uh, um, reconstructed energy for uh, a pion of 20 GV uh, obtained from the inverse response function of the power law. And on the right, uh, uh, you can see uh, the uh, energy resolution um, that uh, has been fitted uh, with, uh, with the function shown uh, there. And in particular, we got uh, a 50% for the six stochastic terms and around 10% for the constant term. So um, then after uh, the, sim the simulation will be uh, performed and finalized, uh, we will uh, build a, a real cell prototype and uh, the, its performances will be tested in test beams. Uh, the design is still under development uh, and uh, will be adapted uh, to low energy pions. Um, then uh, the active layer will be instrumented with uh, the state of the art of uh, resistive micro well or micromegas. Uh, the readout will be performed using uh, um, static ASIC that uh, allows uh, uh, timing and charge measurement of the hits. And so uh, it uh, allows to emulate a semi-digital readout. The design, uh, the construction, and the test has been uh, is a, um, and, uh, comes from the effort of uh, uh, several INFN uh, sites, uh, Bari, Frascati, Roma 3, and Napoli. And uh, um, then the test will be performed at uh, uh, CERN SPS with the Pion and the Moon Beam to get the efficiency and the time resolution. So in conclusion, in these studies uh, with Giant4 uh, um, that I presented here, um, we, uh, we showed some uh, um, Uh, geometry op optimization for the shower containment and the energy resolution studies. However, there is room for, uh, for improvement, and in particular, we uh, want to implement a, detailed, a more detailed geometry for the active layer by um, taking into account the material that will be introduced uh, um, using MPGDs. Then we will uh, implement the detector efficiency and the readout time windows and the semi-digital readout. And we will try to add uh, neutron and photon background in order to simulate the beam induced background and try to um, uh, reject it from the, uh, the actual, the, the real signal. Uh, then the, the optimized geometry will be uh, um, implemented in the Moon Collider software in order to test the performances in the full geometry and a real cell prototype will be tested, constructed and tested. So thank you for uh, the attention. Thank you very much. So, questions? Yeah. And I have a question. In the, for the containment of the shower, uh, in your giant simulation, did you start uh, the, uh, um, the interaction always at the same point, or you, did you leave uh, interaction free to move uh, along the... No, we started the, uh, always at the same okay, point. Okay, because that, that what it really counts in uh, hadronic showers. It's the first, uh, uh, where the first interaction starts and the cascade takes place for containment. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. So next speaker is uh, Thomas Weizmann about the uh, EPICAL2 uh, parameter prototype.
Okay. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, a, s a small prototype of uh, done in the context of generic R&D for ultra-high um, uh, granularity electromagnetic calorimetry. I will explain what I mean by ultra-high in, in the next few slides. So to introduce the concept, this is this ultra-high granularity allows us to do digital calorimetry. So we, the idea of this is to count the number of charged shower particles in sampling layers. And ideally, this would be able to allow us to reduce the fluctuation from the individual samplings. If you're really able to count the particles, then you don't depend on the actual signal they give in the, in the layers. Uh, we need high granularity for that uh, due to the very high particle densities, in particular in a shower core. So we have built a state-of-the-art pixel calorimeter prototype. In fact, one already of quite a few years back where you find a, a publication here where you can look up this one, the one I want to talk about uh, today, the electromagnetic pixel calorimeter. That's where the abbreviation comes from, number two. is similar to the other one, a silicon tungsten stack, but now using more modern sensors, the Alpide sensors, which are, have been developed in the context of the ALICE experiment. And we, so I will describe this um, setup a little bit, and then I, we also discuss a little bit how we simulate the, in detail the detector. And then the main part of my talk will about, be about test measurements, which uh, show the calorimetric performance of this device. We have a detailed study from measurements at DAISY, so at rather low energy, but we are also first preliminary results from SPS for higher energy. This is a little bit of a busy slide, so it shows some of the details of this calorimeter prototype. Um, the upper two figures show the single layer layout, so this is the design drawing where you have a tungsten plate and then you have the Alpides, two Alpide sensors per layer, a chip cable to connect and then a layer cable taking the um, the signals out, and this is how this looks, in fact, uh, in, in real life. This was constructed in Kharkiv in, in the Ukraine, which was a very important contribution for us. This was then stacked together, and here you see the design drawing of the full detector, and this is the actual detector of before sort of further assembly with, with more cooling and, and stuff. Um, so this contains 24 layers, each 3-millimeter tungsten absorber and two alpide CMOS sensors, and these ultra-thin flex cables, which in fact allow this very compact design, which leads to a Molière radius of the order of 11 millimeters of the full device. This is a, um, a sketch of the readout system. We read out by two layers of uh, FPGA um, boards, uh, because this is quite some, you have 25 million pixels in total for this small device. This is quite some data volume that we need. But I don't want to go into details of that here. Uh, just a, a few photos from the test beam measurements. So this was our setup at DAISY. You see here this, the device, in fact, the cables going out to the left and then the, the cooling in the right. And in the front, we have two little scintillators, which are exactly the size of the detector, 3 by 3 centimeters, uh, scintillators coupled to SIPMs. The same setup uh, with a little scintillator in addition here is at the SPS, are just now facing a little bit the other direction. We took data at DAISY between 1 and 5.8 GeV and at H6 at the SPS in, in the range of 20 to 80 GeV with a mixed beam. Um, very important for this device is to really understand what happens microscopically. So we've gone to so some effort to, for the simulation. So we do simulation with all pixels squared. This is a package that goes on top of a full geon simulation, but it uh, simulates the full charge transport in silicon. And here you see a little bit of the details. This is actually a, um, a part of, the, of, a, of a sensor. You see here the, the collect, uh, charge collecting diets up here with a relatively strong field around the epitaxial layer, and then you see here, in fact, the tracks of charges that are transported in the silicon to the, to the charge collecting diets. This is all done in detail, um, and you can see also here two examples how nicely we can describe the behavior of the, of the, of the detector. So this is the cluster size distribution, so from, from uh, as you see, from all the charge tracks in the, in the calorimeter, the Data points are really measured, and the histogram is a simulation with this package. You see that out down to very large, to many orders of magnitude. This is very nicely described by the simulation. You should also note 
like the dominant feature of clusters, of course, you get clusters of, of the average of, a, of a cluster size four, so four pixel hits, but they're very rarely, they are extremely large clusters. And even this feature is nicely described. And here you see two examples of what happens sometimes in the detector. We, re I th we think we really understand well what's going on here. This is in a single layer. Again, it, uh, and, and you should see the, the scale is in millimeters now in this. And you see here a track that actually goes parallel to the sensor. In some cases, you, this happen rarely, but you do, do see this happen. And you have see it happen in the simulation and the, in measurement in the, in the very same way. So this is very nicely described. So we can use that also in, in comparing our measurements. And, and this is, of course, the, the uh, earlier was just a, a very small part of a shower. Now this is a, a, a picture of single event display of a full shower at 5 GV. So you see here a 3D view from the side. The color coding is the depth, so the layer number, in fact. In the, so you, the shower comes in from here, the electron comes in from here, and then showers in the detector. And here you see the different projections from the, from the front and then from the two sides. So you get, maybe get an idea of what kind of information content you have that you can work on. And this is a low energy shower. Of course, you have, you're significantly um, impacted by fluctuations of that. But once we look at the real high energy showers, this will be very interesting indeed. We've performed some calibration. In fact, the detector works out of the box without any calibration already reasonably well. But we can do additional calibration with muons. So we did this both with cosmic muons in the, in the lab, but also with muons in later in the mixed beam at the SPS. And those coincide very nicely. And here you see the different average number of hits in every sensor for, for muon tracks that we can, can identify in the detector. And you see variations of the order of 20%. And that is corrected for, so we have a calibration of the, of the sensitivity of the individual sensors from that. At the moment, we still ignore it within the in-sensor var variation of uh, sensitivity that might be there. We haven't even looked at that, so that there is a potential for an improvement if the sensitivity would be varying with position on the, on the sensor. There's much less sensitivity uh, to, to these variations in thresholds, where this comes from, in the number of clusters. So we have a clusterization for, to find, in fact, the equivalent of tracks clusters of, of hits. There, of course, this varies very little, so this is much less sensitive to, to gain variations, in fact, or, or threshold variations. After this, we, this is what we, what we obtained from uh, the DAISY measurements. So the, this is the two variables that we use for the response. So we just can just count the number of fired pixels or hits, or we can count the number of clusters. Both are reasonable response observables, and you see nice Gaussian-like distributions. They're not completely Gaussian. They're details but we can discuss in detail maybe after the talk if you're interested. Um, but you see uh, the behavior you expect, uh, uh, an increase with beam energy to higher, and the, and the peak is relatively nicely again described with the simulations. The simulation, in fact, I should say, is tuned to the 5 GV point for the number of hits. So there, that's where the agreement is, of course, perfect. And, but all the other curves are also very nicely described. There's a little bit more of a deviation when you look at the cluster distributions, but that's maybe also because the tuning was done with respect to the number of hits. And this is the cluster algorithm we may have to further optimize. So this is now one of the main results uh, I want to present. This is the response of the detector as a function of energy for both hits and clusters. You see a very nice, on this scale, this looks very nicely linear. And the simulation points here are you cannot really distinguish from the, from the measurements, so that nicely fits for both cases. Um, also shown here are, in fact, the results from our earlier prototype, which is a similar uh, principle, but uses a different silicon sensor, the Mimosa sensor, which is much slower. And we had a, actually much more trouble, much more noise and, and problems with that at that point. But the absolute value of the number of hits is very, very close without any intercalibration between the two. So that's what you really get itself. Now we, can, we fitted this with a um, uh, proportionality, with a, a linear function with the offset force to, to zero, which we know is correct from the pedestal measurements. And that's the deviation from this linear behavior here. And here you see some hints of what you could call a nonlinearity. In fact, the simulation of the open points, the simulation uh, for hits is very perfectly linear. So that is, seems to be the in this 
respect the ideal variable, you see a deviation of the number of clusters, and that is probably due to cluster merging. Already at this low energy, you will find some clusters which are touching, and our cluster algorithm then uses that as a, or calls that a single cluster. And that will lead to a, to a relative decrease in the amplitude for the higher you go in energy. Of course, the, f the, fit, the way we do the fit and force it to zero is causes this. It looks like there's a deviation to the, to the upward for in here, but in fact, it's just a saturation when going high. The data now show a slightly different value, and we believe, and that is reflected by the error bars, that it is really explained by the existing nonlinearity in the DZ beam energy distributions that you get. That the nominal beam energy is not exactly, if you can find hints of that in a, in a DZ publication on the test beam, and we discussed with the people, and this error is our best knowledge how to take that into account. But in fact, the nice feature is that the difference between hits and clusters is really exactly the same as in simulation. So we think we really understand this, and in the, the genuine response of the detector is consistent with full linearity. And this, um, my next, uh, the next result I want to discuss is the resolution. These are two plots. The data points, the blue data points, are identical on the on the two plots. What you see here first is a comparison to simulation again. And then again, you see that maybe there's something about the properties of the test beam that we, ha we have to understand better. We have to perform two simulations. So you s first of all, you see the general behavior you would expect, this, this one of root E uh, dependence of the resolution. And you see the main feature that the, in this, the clusters are better than the hits. Because apparently, they take out some of the fluctuations that we do see. And then we compare the two sets of simulations. One uses the um, beam energy spread that is given in the publication by DAISY for as being constant as a function of energy for, this te for these test beams. In fact, we use a different test beam line than, than was discussed in that paper. And this is the open red symbols. And you see at the low energy, this even overshoots, but it doesn't really get the exact energy dependence. While if you take out the energy spread, of course, you're, you're much too low. So we think, in fact, there is some energy spread which is maybe not completely understood here. And part of all the, the deviation that we see in the data from simulation is due to this energy spread in the beam. On the right-hand side, we have a comparison of our results to our earlier prototype again, where the resolution was a little worse. And that was mainly due to the fact that we had like 30% of dead sensors in this in this. Uh, older prototype. Now we have a fully, we have one dead sensor which is way in the back of the detector, so it doesn't really matter. And you see uh, actually a nice improvement. In fact, the uh, resolution for the clusters, which is the, the, the squares, is very close to the parameterization given from measurements of with the Kali's physics prototype detector. Um, well, of course, it wasn't measured at low energy, it's slightly higher energy, but extrapolated down. Um, yeah, so it's nice that with a digital calorimeter now we get really very close to the, the state-of-the-art electromagnetic silicon, uh, analog silicon tungsten uh, calorimeter that is around. And then you can do much more. So I, we, we have only started to look in, of course, you can do with the, this, this the longitudinal segmentation, you can do longitudinal distributions. This is here for hits and clusters, and you see the, the shape you expect agrees again very nicely with simulation. We see, for example, I can go into this subtle details between the depth of the shower in hits and clusters, which is an interesting feature which we are going to further explore. And then you can also look at, at the lateral distribution. So this, well, maybe first, first go here. These are the full lateral distributions at the different depths of the detector. And you see the nice feature of a very narrow shower core in the early shower development, which gets broader and broader in a, the further you go into the detector. And then you can combine this. This is both longitudinal. This is the, the longitudinal profile um, for different rings around the shower center. And you see here how this, the maximum of the shower shifts depending on where you sit in the core or in the periphery. This we can, we can do much more on this. And uh, this, as I said, it's just started. And for example, you can also do this event by event, of course. These are now average distributions. But there's a very high potential in there. Let me now briefly, for the rest of the talk, turn to uh, first results from the SPS and to what the we can do with the detector is maybe also illustrated a little bit by it, like this from this full spectrum of the mixed beam at, uh, at the SPS. 
This is at 80 GeV where we had a high muon component because we closed the collimator. So you see muons being produced from pions absorbed in the collimators. In the we can describe the, the hadron and muon part of the spectrum very, very nicely, and we see nicely that it's well separated from the electron peak here, which is very, very sharp. And there's extremely no noise in this detector. Um, we've looked, this is very preliminary, we looked at the linearity. This is these old points I already showed before, and now this is sort of a out of the box, um, which we, we put the detector one and a half years later again in beam. It worked like this. There was no further recalibration uh, necessary between the two data sets, this very nicely. And this very relatively mild nonlinearity, I think, also confirms that the stronger nonlinearity here is really due to the properties of the beam at, at DC in this, in this uh, point. We also looked at the um, energy resolution that looks very nicely like, so in fact, the, 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 this is now only from the hits because the cluster algorithm we know we have to improve for higher energies because there you get more cluster overlap because of the higher particle density, but the number of hits you can count. And in fact, the, the fit function here that we already fit to the lower data points is exactly the same now for, for high energies. So this exactly relates very, very nicely. We also expect that with clusters we will be better than that. <coughs> so, but that has to be studied in the, in the future. And then now uh, the, for the very last uh, slides, I want to just demonstrate a little where, where one can go with the detector and what the potential is. Of course, this detector was, for the idea for, for this, using this technology came from a forward calorimeter in Alice, where we want to separate nearby, close by photons, very close by photons. So now we simulated this in this calorimeter. This is now actually a simultaneous uh, um, two shower event of a 30 GeV and a 250 GeV electron at 1.2 millimeter separation. Where the, from the full event, if you know where it is, you can guess it. But if you, for example, look at the projection, the two dashed lines are the impact points of the, of the calorimeter, of the, of the two, two particles. You see the main, the high energy shower, you don't see the low energy shower. But now you look at the, you do a very little thing, you just look only at the first six layers in the calorimeter. The, the other was fully integrated. And then here you, uh, it's, it's hard to see here, this is again the integrated event display. But here then in the projection of these first six layers, you very nicely see two strong peaks. And this, this is 1.2 millimeters, so one millimeter separation is clearly possible. Maybe we, I think we can do, go down to a few tenths of a millimeter. So there, there, there's really where, where the potential is. This is simulation only for the time being. So let me uh, summarize. I think we have prov proven that digital calorimetry works. <coughs> we, we had shown this already with our earlier prototypes. We have confirmed this with the new one, which has a much better performance, which is, I think, essentially due to using the uh, more modern sensor, the Alpide sensor, which has very no noise. And in fact, also the readout speed of that is compatible with modern experiments, so we can actually use that technology in, also in the Alice experiment. We've seen we have good energy linearity and resolution. At the moment, the, the more detailed study is lim limited by the properties of the accelerator. We have to want to see what we can find out at SPS more. And then there's, as I said, there's extremely high potential for this for future experiments in general. Uh, you can, if, you, you, if you think, think of particle flow, what you can do, single muon, to, you can, should be able to see single muon tracks going through electromagnetic shower and take it out, things like that. So that is... Uh, but that we still have to do. So with that, I want to close with a uh, slide of all the people, people helping here. And I would again like to emphasize uh, as a personal note that I'm very happy that the LTU, this uh, institute in the Ukraine in Kharkiv, in a, in a city where have suffered very much, had a strong contribution here. And while we are enjoying here the nice weather, they are in a very dire situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Yeah. So thanks for the nice results. Of course, you, you produce uh, in a real calorimeter, we, you would have huge amount of data. How do you see uh, a little bit the, the R&D needed on the data processing? Yeah. 
I must admit we haven't really uh, done anything on, a, on the problem that you would have in a full-scale calorimeter of this kind. What we want to do in the ALICE experiment is use two layers of this technology together with silicon pad, which is very similar to the CMS HD card. In fact, we intend to use the similar electronics also, as you know. Um, and then, then still with two layers, the amount of data volume from the pixels is extremely high. So if you would want to go CMS or Atlas, that's impossible at the moment. In Alice, we've, what we find is that with the, with the low um, particle density in PP and, and the relatively low rate in LED LED, we can probably do it. The, the L-Pite has three, three, so you will get pile up, but the, but the L-Pite has three buffers for every pixel. So you can get, even if you get another event within the processing time of the signal, you can store it. And if you have uh, like randomization of hits, then you, then you should be able to get everything out. But it's a, in a full calorimeter, I think the way to go would be to have more intelligence on the chip and do some really on-chip, uh, like taking a one by one uh, square millimeter sub software pixel and counting the number of hits fired in that pixel and ship only that number, something like that. But, uh, Yeah, very nice talk. Um, uh, I, I wanted to ask you this. In a very granular calorimeter, uh, it has been shown that, uh, in fact, the pattern of the energy distribution from a shower, in the case we studied was with muons, carries information on the energy, not just the total energy release. So in principle, if you can use a convolutional neural network capability at reconstruction level, you gain a resolution, you gain information. And I was wondering whether you uh, plans to study this uh, on the front end or even because yeah. you would like to do this uh, online because doing it offline requires you to save everything. And yeah. Uh, yeah, but we, ha we have done some studies with this older prototype, which is the same principle and the data is around for a much longer time. What you can do offline. So what we and what we intend to do is to do a real 3D reconstruction of the shower, and then you use all the information from that shower to, to know about the energy. I agree that should be possible in a, in a more simplistic way to do online, and we should explore that, but there's no manpower for the moment to, to do that. But uh, it's a very straightforward idea in principle. To do it is another question. <laughs> okay. It's intriguing the separation that you've shown between the two uh, closed uh, um, showers, the 30 GV and 20 and 50. Yeah, this is, uh, of course, is a simulation, but in fact, you do have data. It's separately for DAISY and from DAISY and SPS. Have you tried you to overlap? To, yeah, that, that's the next step. We first want to understand clearly uh, well defined single showers fully, and then we'll do that. Okay. Absolutely. No. Thank you. We can do it in da with data. In fact, we do have, at DAISY, we even have measured pileup. So we have two shower, three shower, and even four shower events because we had high rate. So we can do it on real overlapping events even. And we can always get a good position resolution of the incoming shower from the first layer, which is before tungsten, in fact. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, we, we, uh, we should go on. So thank you very much, yeah. speaker again. <laughs> Okay, so our next speaker is the, uh, uh, Vincent uh, Baudry, Baudry about the uh, uh, prototype of the Acaris uh, silicon tungsten calorimeter. Good. Thank you. Okay, so I will give you some, some recent results of, of our technological prototype of highly granular, not as high as Thomas, uh, silicon calorimeter. So this is a work from, from institute in France, Korea, uh, Japan, and more recently uh, Spain. So I will first start with give you, by giving you uh, 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 back the philosophy which is behind those technolo technological choices we have made. So we are building calorimeters for, for particle flow, and the particle flow, uh, we aim to measure charged particles by uh, matching the cluster in the calorimeter with, with the track. And what is not often said uh, that uh, 
we want to do that using only the spatial information in, avoid, in, in order to avoid to bring back the fluctuation from the calorimeter into the measurement. The aim at the end is to measure the best uh, energy resolution for jets. And for that, so we use charged particles from, from uh, the, the energy of charged particles from the tracker and use only the ECALF to measure the, the photons and 10% uh, of the energy comes into uh, uh, neutral hadrons. Uh, what has come recently is also the timing information uh, could bring some information uh, by the, the particle ID and we have seen in the presentation from, from uh, uh, Torben that should be uh, possible. This is something that has been put forward by, by the EGCAL. So the ID is 20 years old but it's still evolving. So for the ECAL that we are building, the, now the, 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 the mission is to actually spot the tracks and showers in the, the, the calorimeter, and secondly, to the measure the energy of the photons and uh, neutral uh, hadrons in, uh, in there with a timer of flight. This is something we are looking at. So uh, the, 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 the requirement for, for the ECAL are the standard ones, uh, emerticity, resolution, uniformity, etc. But we add this very high granularity in the calorimeter. Optimally for 500, 500 GV, so this is high energy, we, the, the, the optimal is 5 by 5 uh, square millimeters and of the order of 30 layers. If you go to lower energy, you can uh, release a bit this criteria for higher energy like like click or muon colliders that should be even a stronger uh, uh, requirement. We also want to have compact showers in order to separate them the best in, in, in uh, uh, compact uh, uh, jets. And those te technical requirements then comes on for on the electronics and the integrations. We are uh, playing with hundreds of millions of channels and uh, we have to operate them. Have the electronics inside the detector and of course it's heating so we have to cool it. And we want to build also of the order of 100,000 uh, boards with an optimal size that would be of the order of, of uh, a thousand channel per board. So this is the challenge. We think that for this challenge the best is the, the, the silicon uh, uh, tungsten calorimeter because we have a small uh, Molière radius and we benefit from the, the flexibility you can have with the, the silicon, but also from this intrinsic stability. This is much easier to calibrate. From beam test to beam test, we see that the response stays very stable. The structure, mechanical structure we've built one, so we know this is, this is fine. The problem is to build the uh, detector elements that will fit into that. And this is the program of Calis. So that was our physical prototype from 2005 to 2011 that Thomas mentioned as, as, as comparison, where we had one by one square centimeters. And since then, we are working on this technological prototype in which we have the electronics which is embedded, which is power pulsed, uh, self-triggering, and uh, with a delayed readout, and we should aim at having a signal to noise ratio, which is the, the position of the MIP divided by the signal of the noise, which is above 12. So that's, that's a bit of the challenge. And we want to build those, those boards here. Typically, this is, the, this is the boards we have, so that they can be in integrated into long uh, cassette of, of, the of, the of the order of eight boards, which are read out at a single end. So what I will be presenting today is the uh, uh, prototype here in which you have 15 of those boards read out in a stack, which is more or less a tower of this uh, later prototype. So I would say we are more or less at the uh, middle of the way, but this is a logarithmic scale on number of, of uh, uh, elements we need to, to build. So those prototypes are built on this Skyrock chip, which is made by, by Omega. At the entrance, we have a preamplifier, and the signal is split into three branches. One with a fast uh, 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 shaping, which allows to, to make the, the trigger and the timing signal. And the two others are with two gains of uh, low gain and high gain, with a factor of 10 between the two. And at the end, we store the information when we have a, a, a trigger in, of three branches. Uh, TDC, this high gain and low gain, and we have to select two of them. They are uh, analog analogically stored and later digitized. So this is quite a complex chip. We have of the order of 600 configuration bits, 
but it has a low consumption provided we can power pulse it with the, the uh, ILC-like uh, uh, duty cycle. So we want to integrate 16 of those chips into our boards and that's a long way to go there because we have uh, many issues. The first one is that you have to put all the, the, the signals from one board to the next and that's of the order of 140 uh, uh, signals going there. But uh, and operate uh, uh, the, the, the chip with uh, enough stability. And we also have mechanical constraints because uh, you want the slab to be uh, properly aligned. And uh, we want to glue the wafers, the, the silicon wafers on it. And so you need a flatness which is good enough so that we don't break the, the, the wafers. So the, this is also a challenge for uh, uh, building those, those, uh, those bots. So now we end up having four, uh, three type of bots like this with uh, an evolution of, 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 of the, this one. So uh, here we have the chip which are packaged and, and, and glued on the, on, on the board. That has evolved into this uh, solution in which we have tried the different solution for, for uh, 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 connections. So this one, uh, in order to, to make it compatible, with, we need an adapter board here. And more recently, we have been able to make those boards working in which the chip are embedded into the PCB and BAM bonded. So that allows you to have a much thinner uh, design uh, at the cost of uh, not being able to put any regulator or, or, or decoupling here. So they are, they are, they are harder to, to, um, to operate. And uh, the recent, uh, most recent addition was uh, uh, reshuffling of, of the DAQ into a compact design uh, compact with uh, the space available with between the ECAL and the HCAL, that's about 30 millimeters. And this board here, which makes the readout of a full, full cassette at the end, is of the order of uh, six centimeters. So we are close to the design we want. And uh, we can read 15 of those boards with a single board, on which we also have, and this is quite important for, for us, the uh, full debugging system. So you, you see here online the, the beam thought that has been there, and this is a secondary beam spot due to the FEV 13s, which are a bit shifted, that was not corrected on the online display. And here you see the, the, uh, uh, during the data, data taking the shower profile by uh, heat counting. So we went to DESI uh, in November 2021 and again in March. Uh, after two years of shifting, we had uh, three test beams that were cancelled due to, to the COVID. <laughs> Uh, and there we did mostly, well, uh, commissioning and, and recording our first uh, uh, real showers into the, the calorimeter after so much, so much time. So we had two configurations of the prototypes in which we have put a different amount of, of tungsten. The first one was okay for low energy uh, particles and then later we uh, increased the amount of tungsten so that we can uh, uh, contain all the showers at the, uh, between 1 and 6 GV at, at DAISY. The second run we ran together with the uh, HCAL also. The, the, uh, and we could do some run with and without tungsten, though the, the setup is flexible enough so that we can slide uh, different tungsten in there. So you have some pictures here, the, the, the effective uh, active area here, and the, the equally spaced uh, by 15, mm, 15 millimeters uh, of the layers. The first thing for those self-triggering uh, devices is actually to uh, tame the noise. Uh, we really have to be, uh, we are sensitive to, to, to noise because we have limited memory space in the chips. And the, the chip is done so that as soon as you have one hit, you do the full readout of the 64 channels. So that, has loose, that gives you many noise channels so you can study it. And one way to study it a nice way is to look at the correlations between all the channels and look what what is the different causes of, of uh, coherent uh, noise. So this is a summary of uh, all those measurements. So we have 15 layers times 1024 channels times 15 memory. So we have to fit all this. And one line here is a single ASIC. And you see that there, there are correlations. Uh, with the, the, the level of the pedestal, this is the, the, the pedestal level, is essentially uh, uh, Current with the uh, um, uh, ASIC by ASIC. If you do this analysis of, of coherent noise, we end up, sorry, we end up with this figure. 
what you can see is mostly that we are we have a, a, a sigma uh, a noise distribution which is of the order of uh, two to three AD counts. If you have a ray, and this has to be compared with the uh, level of the MIP, which is of the order of 70 to 140, depending on the uh, thickness of the wafer. If you have a, a very sharp eyes, you will see that the, the, the noise will be slightly different in the different columns. They correspond to the different uh, uh, layers we have. And that corresponds actually to the different type of boards we have in, in, the, in, the, in the calorimeter. So this is the latest version of, of, of the board, uh, the DCFAV13, where we have very uh, stable uh, conditions. The, that, was, that has integrated many of the experience we gained on those early boards. And this is the, 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 the COP, the newest uh, uh, version of it, with, uh, which were, we were really happy to see that it was working so, so well. Actually, we cheated a little bit because we had to put some coupling deck capacitors at some point to make it them work. So it's, they are not fully without uh, decoupling, but we are really happy to see them working so well. If you look into the details of, the, of, the, of this noise map, so you basically see, ah, sorry, basically see here that the, this level of noise is ASIC by ASIC here. There are some uh, global uh, features, like here we have noisy power lines close to the, the uh, uh, acquisition board. And some channels we are repeating. This is always the same number of channels. This is due to the layout of, 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 the, uh, of the board. So this is the kind of, of uh, uh, things we are fighting for. And we had to kill those channels because, uh, as I said, the noise is really the enemy if you have a local storage into the, the front-end readout. So that's something that has to be monitored all the time and, and really be uh, uh, addressed. Once the noise is, is made, then we look at the MIP. We, without the tungsten into the detector, we use the electrons as, as punch through. And uh, you see here the, the, the mixed spec MIP spectrum for, for the FEV and, 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 and the COB, and you see that they are very similar. Well, you see a little bit more the bumps here, but that's really some, some uh, secondary effects. And we'll use this uh, uh, MIP calibration to, uh, oh, sorry, forgot that one. So this is the uniformity of the MIP calibration. So you see if this is very nice, except for, for the, the channels that have been uh, removed. So this is for, for FEV12, and this is for the, the latest board where uh, uh, FEV13 with seeker wafers, so we have highest uh, response of, of the signal. What came as a bad news is that we have seen that some of our older boards uh, started to have some problems. So I've drawn here the limit between the, f the four wafers we have glued on, the, on, on each of the board, and you see that we are losing some of the channel on the, on the side here. Maybe here, and we are suspecting this is due to the deformation or some stress there was during the uh, transportation of the boards. So that, that comes really as the bad surprise, and we are investi investigating that to know why the, the, the gluing will not hold. So we hope this will not happen so soon with the, the other boards. But okay, that's an issue. So this calibration of MIPS we want to put inside to look at, uh, to, to do the simulation. So uh, we use the, the uh, ILC soft and, and uh, we have there a very, very flexible uh, DD4HTP uh, framework, uh, on which we, we just change the XML configuration file and, and change completely our, our, our setup. And the digitization, this is ongoing work. We uh, implement both the fast uh, shaping for the trigger and time measurement and the slow shaping. And that's uh, something we, we will add. So now this is not into the, the, uh, the simulation I've, I've shown here, but you see that even with, without this digitization, that looks very similar to Monte Carlo. You see the, 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 the two showers here, very sparse. In the data, you still have some cells of, of noise in addition. Uh, and that can be used to compare the data which is in the shower. So this is the spectrum we see in individual cells for uh, the, the full layers. So for the uh, FEV13, we can go, uh, you, you, you see the, 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 the peak at one MIP, two MIP, three MIP, etc. And you can directly monitor the threshold, which is put at roughly one quarter of a MIP. So we measure them very nicely and, and that could be used also to do internal calibration uh, uh, in the detector with electromagnetic showers. 
This is with the uh, highest gain we have with the, the, the chip. With the curb, this is slightly uh, worse, but we still definitely see the, the, the nice uh, uh, mid peaks, and, and uh, we have a very very nice uh, threshold. And for the oldest one here, where we also were gluing the the, the thinner wafers, there you cannot distinguish the the the, uh, the characteristic of the of the mips in, in the showers. So. The conclusion is that you can do in shower calibration using this signal if you have good enough uh, system. Last point we looked at uh, was the, the uh, uh, saturation. So um, this is a shower profile. Uh, here you have the, the layer numbers and this is the response of the cells in unit of MIPS. So you have a peak at one MIP. This is just exactly what I've shown on logarithmic mail. Scale and you can see that we sh we are expecting signal up to 40 uh, MIPS into into the showers, and using the highest gain here, you we have seen some uh, saturation, so that depends really on the thickness of the wafer. The thicker, the the earliest is the saturation. But I say this is for the highest gain, and and uh, 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 in in all mean by, by the detector. So to go to higher energy at CERN. 100 GV, basically you have to scale that with the energy, we will saturate everything. So we go for lower gain, uh, we have to divide it by a factor of, of five and see for this uh, uh, um, uh, uh, lower gain uh, channel that has ba barely used up to until now. So I will, I will finish on the, the next steps. So we'll go for test beam at CERN in uh, the next month. We're integrating more of those new, new balls, removing some of the olders, put more tungsten so that we have full containment. And meanwhile, we're also looking on the, uh, uh, f finalizing the design of uh, new boards that will also be more flexible with a better uh, um, uh, filtering of the noise for the high voltage, for example, and which are suitable for uh, the chaining of the board up to, to eight units. This is something I haven't shown anymore. On the outlook, we, we are happy that we had our first uh, 15 layers working properly. This is still kind of training phase. I haven't shown any resolution plot because this still needs correction of defects, the masking, etc. So that we have also the simulation and the, the um, data matching properly. But a uh, month since the, the, the last data taking, that was too, too fast. And uh, most of the work layer are working as expected, but uh, as I said, we have some, some sign of aging here. So that's uh, something, one of the, the of concern we are looking at right now. So thank you for your attention. And uh, I should mention the thank you for all the young people here that have been really devoted to, to the analysis, not so young people, but also devoted persons. And thanks also for the engineering tool, uh, teams from our lab, they are really dedicated. So, thank you very much. And the questions? <laughs> Everything is clear? <laughs> So maybe just, uh, I mean, you didn't show the energy resolution, but you could say a little bit about the sampling term and so on, what you... Well, this has changed quite a lot. Uh, from the simulation, without any, also without the decision, we go as low as 12%. But we know this is too optimistic. <laughs> and the, the resolution, the first plot we've done, I've, I don't show them because they're really, really bad. The, the, the thing is that, um, we, we should shoot at some points where we have no defects like those masking cells because mm -hmm. the showers are very compact and if you have all those uh, channels which are masked at the same place, this makes a channel and really a, a hole in the distribution and that degrades the, the, the performances. So we have to do a selection to see the, really the regions where we have everything working perfectly. That's, uh, 
Okay, but uh, I mean, still it's interesting because in real big calorimeter with lots of channels, there are always a few yes, channels. Yes, so th that's to complement also the discussion we had before. We are looking also at method where we would fit the 3D profile and do we would jump over those noise uh, cells and, and, and masking ones. But at the end, we know that with the newer uh, 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 version of the boards, in principle, we should have no mask channel. That's but okay. That's the challenge. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. If not, uh, let's thanks to speaker again. Thank you. Okay, so the uh, I think uh, last talk is uh, uh, from uh, uh, we uh, conveners about the uh, summary of the uh, poster for the uh, calorimeter sessions. So we cover uh, test, test, test. Yes. Okay. So two conveners we will cover, and the first will be uh, uh, by uh, Christoph uh, Clement, and then the second will be by you. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. so we divided. So uh, uh, we have the challenging task of uh, summarizing the posters. Uh, so we split the task um, uh, with Toshi uh, Yuki. Uh, so we received uh, receive 20 posters. We divided in a few categories um, that you will see up here. So I will uh, skip directly into the material. So the first few uh, posters we cover are about LHC, related to LHC and H HLHC calorimeters. And you know also in between with the run three upgrade, which is uh, um, still H, uh, sorry, LHG. Um, the first uh, poster is about the CMS high granularity calorimeter. So we saw already talked this morning. Uh, this poster is more about focused on the engineering challenges. Um, so this calorimeter uh, is rather complex, is occupying the same volume of the original end cap calorimeter. However, it's actually uh, more compact than before because some space was freed to introduce an additional muon layer. Uh, so the, the total thickness in terms of uh, radiation length is still the same. You have challenges in terms of radiation uh, damages and the wall calorimeter will be operated at minus 30 degrees while you're actually dissipating 125 kilowatt per end cap. Uh, so you see there's a lot of uh, uh, technical challenges uh, and then this is, will be, uh, so uh, you will see this on the poster. Uh, the next contribution is about the design and characterization of a fully functional focal E prototype in Alice. So focal is forward calorimeter, uh, which will extend the scope of the Alice experiment. And the E refers to the electromagnetic part of that calorimeter. Uh, so this new capability, which is actually not possible right now uh, with Alice, is that we allow you to uh, do basically part on distribution functions down to x of 10 to the minus 6, uh, which cannot be probed by any, uh, by any other experiment down to that. So it goes even beyond LHCB. Uh, and in particular, I will do this via prompt photon production. Uh, so here you need excellent photon pi zero separation in the forward region. Uh, and which leads you to this calorimeter uh, system. So here you have a stack of high granularity and low granularity later, layers. Uh, and such a stack is being uh, developed and tested in BIM. So here there are results from SPS in 2021 where you can see the MIP. Uh, there are some uh, uniformity studies and there is a full demonstrator which will include additional uh, parts of the electronics uh, which are going to be tested in June. So. Uh, you will get more detail on the poster. Uh, let's, next, uh, let me move to a couple of slides on the and posters about ATLAS. So here is about the liquid argon electromagnetic calorimeter, uh, which was upgraded for run three, which is starting now. Uh, so essentially the world trigger pass uh, was upgraded. So we, in the original ATLAS, the legacy ATLAS, the calorimeter triggers were entirely analog. Uh, now the liquid argon calorimeter is completely upgraded to a digital readout, uh, which provides a huge improvement in granularity of what you can do at the trigger level. So you see the very, very coarse granularity in the trigger, in the legacy, in the all, let's say, uh, liquid argon. And now what we have now for run three, so you have layers, you can really do shower shape at the first level of trigger. 
so this is this is installed, this is running, uh, and here you have uh, already from the pilot run of two, October 21, you can see already some energy reconstructed in supercells, which are capturing also you know photons from Bremsstrahlung, so you can reconstruct and compare with the fully offline energy. So it's just an example. Uh, the upgrade of the Atlas hadronic tile calorimeter. So the hadronic calorimeter of Atlas is mostly the big upgrade is for HLLHC. Uh, it will also move to a full digital trigger, but only at the HLLHC. So this requires uh, re remaking the entire readout electronics. Also because of radiation harness, now we're talking even for hadron calorimeter, we are talking about 100 grays, which for the technology usually used for hadron calorimeter is challenging. Uh, so it requires a fully replacement of all the electronics and calibration systems. Uh, and you will find uh, more details on Antonio's uh, uh, poster. Uh, here is the poster which is focused on time calibration, monitoring and performance. Uh, so this is also for the tile, so hadronic calorimeter of Atlas in run two. I mean, we heard some calorimeters uh, looking at timing on zillions of channels. Here is at the smaller scales, only 10,000 channels, already some challenge. Uh, you have several plots like this showing you a map of the quality of the timing. So the timing is very important because, so we are sam sampling the signal at 40 megahertz. Uh, and the energy reconstruction relies on the precise timing. Um, and also because, of course, if you had more time, maybe you would to do the reconstruction, maybe you would be maybe more independent on the timing, but because you want to do this at the trigger level very, very fast, you actually need to rely on the good timing. So you need to calibrate, you need a robust timing, you know what your ti need to know what your timing is, you need to find as soon as there is an outlier, there is a problem, you need to identify it. Uh, we have measured also the cell time resolution, and also you can use the timing here for finding non-collision uh, backgrounds. Con so beam-induced backgrounds, there is a very tiny bit. It's not like the Mion Collider, uh, but there is a little bit of it uh, in Atlas as well at LHC. Uh, here is a poster which looks at the long-term aging of PMTs uh, for high luminosity LHC. So the Atlas Hadron Calorimeter is using about 10,000 PMT, PMTs, which were installed at the, in, at the beginning of LHC. And of course, at the end of HLLHC, these PMTs will be very old. Uh, so we have to ask our question, is that realistic? Uh, so here are some studies then from, from the PISA group uh, showing the evolution of the current uh, installed Atlas PMTs in, in the Hadron Calorimeter. And you can see the response is falling down. Uh, after as a function of the integrated charge. So there is a numerical model developed which indicates that uh, about 8% of the PMNTs would lose so much during HLLHC that's not acceptable. Uh, and we need to replace them with a different uh, type of uh, PMTs. Uh, the PISA uh, group uh, developed a precision test stand to do actually very long-term studies of the aging of PMTs and have tested a new Hamamatsu PMT uh, up to 500 Coulomb, uh, which would then cover, I think, more or less the entire duration of HLLHC. The red ones are the current PMTs in Atlas, and here are the new PMTs, which show very good behavior. Okay, moving on to particle reconstruction. So there was, there is a poster about deep learning techniques, uh, in particular to reconstruct photons and electrons versus jets in the CM, CMS calorimeter. Uh, so you, re you reconstruct the heats in the uh, lead tungsten state crystals, then you cluster the, uh, the, uh, the cells together, and then you make super clusters because your photons will convert. They will emit Bremsstrahlung photons. So in the end, when you reach the face of the kilometer, you have multiple clusters. And you need to group the, cl the clusters together to uh, go back to the photon energy uh, in a proper way. And uh, if you do that in a bad way, of course, you will not measure the energy correctly. So right now, the current algorithm, there is a pattern in delta, in eta and phi, where you have this mustache shape where people decide, the algorithm decide to group the, the clusters together, but it's a little bit rigid. Uh, here, there's a graph-based machine learning algorithm, which was tested to do this grouping instead, much smarter and gives you actually improvement in energy resolution, uh, uh, immunity to pile up and particle identification. Uh, then here we have a poster which is looking at the single particle uncertainties and local hadron calibration for particle flow in ATLAS. So the idea of particle flow is of course that for low energy charge hadrons you have the track measurements which are very good. 
much better than the calorimeter, but the charge, the, the tracking is not measuring neutral particles. So you want to replace the energy from the calorimeter by tracks, at least up to a certain PT, and then remove that from the calorimeter and take the remaining, what's remaining calorimeter to, of course, model the neutrals. Uh, so for very, of course, what is the uncertainty on these process processes? Uh, well, it's very difficult to know what is the uncertainty on your jet energy uh, scale and your jet energy uh, for very high PT jets because above 2 GV, 2 TV, you don't really have, uh, you don't have an in-situ method anymore and you don't have test beam, of course, and so on. Uh, so instead, what is done is to propagate particle per particle, so we know what's the response for, for a single, let's say, hadrons, and then we propagate that through the world chain and derive the uncertainty on the world jet. Uh, what has been done in ATLAS was, so far was not done on the particle flow jet, and this study proved that the same technique could be applied to p-flow jets. Uh, here for the particle flow jets of ATLAS, uh, essentially the clusters, which are included, they are calibrated at the e EM scale. Uh, and I'm sure Nina uh, can explain you more about the EM scale uh, later on if you don't know about this. Uh, here what you can do is you can check the characteristic of each cluster to determine whether this was more likely a hadronic energy deposit or more likely an electromagnetic deposit and give it a weight. So this was done uh, used in ATLAS before, but this has not been combined with the particle flow. Uh, what this plot shows is that actually there is some very promising results which could actually, combining the two, could help a lot the resolution. Okay, a few words about future calorimeters. So there is, uh, there was, there is a poster about noble liquid calorimetry for future FCC experiments. So uh, there is a, very, a large range of very nice technological developments and simulations at various levels. Uh, so, for example, okay, here you can see the electrode arrangement. Uh, the pre-shower is actually incorporated by just simply, I think, in the PCB itself. So, it's, I think it's the continuity in the PCB here. Uh, so, very neat. Uh, here, because now the number of channels is absolutely huge, but you still need feed-through through for the liquid argon cry cryostat. Uh, so, they are investigating connect connectorless feed-throughs, and I understand that they have found a solution. So connectorless feed throughs. So I will probably ask uh, later on what, exactly what's that. Um, also, so different electrode configuration have been studied to minimize the crosstalk. Uh, they have shown that they think they can reach a signal to noise of ratio of five for MIPS per cell. Uh, they have been also looking at carbon fiber cryostat, which could decrease the amount of material in front of a calorimeter by 10, by a factor 10 compared to aluminum cryostat, which is, sounds like amazing. Uh, and then, so in uh, relatively conservative scenarios, they can have 8% sampling term. I think this scenario actually does not include the fi uh, carbon fiber cryostat, so I guess that could be even better. Uh, and they also look at, uh, for example, tau final complicated fi tau final states. Uh, the Krylin uh, semi-homogeneous crystal calorimeter for future muon collider, so here again, the big challenge at the Mion Collider is the radiation from the beam-induced background. Uh, so they're looking at the lead fluoride crystals, uh, and in particular having 10 by 10 by 40 uh, millimeters. That prototypes have been built, uh, like two modules back to back like this. Here you have a board with the silicon PMTs, uh, the PMs, and uh, actually, so they have put together a prototype of front-end electronics together with the, the CPMs and, measure, and pulse that with picosecond UV lasers and show that they could reach a certain picosecond uh, time resolution. Of course, radiation effects on the crystal is also very interesting. So they actually here radiated, uh, so they expect about 10 to the 14 neutrons per square centimeter and a TID of 10 to the minus four uh, gigarad uh, per year. Uh, so here it shows uh, the effect. So they see the effect of 40% degradation on the crystals uh, after four megarad and actually no effect from the neutrons were observed at 10 to the 13 at least. Uh, then um, here this poster present the high granularity scintillator strip electromagnetic calorimeter. So you have scintillating strips uh, in two different directions to emulate an XY pattern. So you get XY coordinate in the five by five millimeter. Uh, a large technological prototype was constructed. So here you can see one detection layer, and here you can see the 30 layer assembled and integrated. 
So a lot, this has been characterized at the per channel, this all looks good. Uh, the calibration with LEDs were done. They can very nicely see the, the photoelectrons. Uh, you can also see the, so looking at cosmic ray showers, you can look at uh, the lambda distributions. You here to see the shower. They have good agreement with simulation. They are investigating some trend of, it seems that the ADCs per MIP is decreasing versus slowly versus three months. So this is an investigation, but globally, this is a very promising and mature technology which has been uh, fully built and integrated in a large prototype. Uh, and then finally, I think, uh, so this uh, is a test beam result from a dual readout calorimeter, so exploiting both uh, scintillation and sharing of life uh, in a way so that you can actually on shower per shower determine the M fraction, uh, w which has a very, very strong potential for the future. So they have re test results in electrons, uh, and here you can see that they actually measure the calibration constant. Uh, I think it's, uh, okay, uh, doesn't matter, it's number of photons per GV, I believe, for the scintillation and for the Cherenkov, and it's actually very, very stable with the energy. So this is also very promising and a large prototype which was built. Okay, so now we move uh, to the second part. So. I Okay, I will use this microphone uh, to just uh, minimize the transition time. Okay, so uh, uh, next uh, I will cover the uh, uh, main DR8 posters, like uh, uh, three for Mu2E and three for MEG2, and uh, two uh, remain for the uh, other uh, calorimeter uh, applications. And the first one is the uh, calorimetry for intensity frontier experiment, uh, nam namely the precision physics. So as we already heard in the morning session, the, uh, this uh, poster uh, is uh, uh, related to the Mu2E calorimetry. And uh, this uh, uh, Mu2E and the MEG2 uh, experiments are related to the uh, charged lepton flavor violating uh, phenomena. And this is pra practically forbidden in the standard model. And if, that means also the, uh, if we find, find any signal, this means the uh, discovery of the new physics. So uh, this is the uh, rather actively uh, uh, looking for, looked for. And uh, so this uh, poster uh, uh, is uh, uh, introducing this uh, calorimeter uh, design and uh, uh, operation, and also the uh, uh, mechanical integrity into the uh, Mu2E uh, experiment. And uh, next is the uh, automated uh, uh, quality control station for the uh, calibration of the Mu2E calorimeter uh, readout unit. So uh, this uh, calorimeter, uses uh, cesium iodide, uh, like uh, 700 uh, <coughs> crystals. And uh, this is read out by the uh, silicon PMs. And uh, this uh, test uh, station uh, can um, monitor the, uh, for example, the uh, uh, this one, uh, silicon PM gain and photon detection efficiency and uh, charge at the different light intensities and uh, bias voltages. And uh, during this operation, uh, this uh, moni uh, can be monitored and uh, stable operation uh, could be uh, checked. Okay, so this uh, next is the uh, design and assembly and operation of the uh, scintillator-based uh, uh, cosmic ray tagger with a silicon PM readout. So basically, uh, two uh, plastic scintillator readout by CPMs are uh, prepared to calibrate the uh, 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 Mu2E calorimeter uh, by using a cosmic ray. And uh, flat distributions are already obtained, and uh, these uh, uh, zenith angle distributions are well uh, uh, good uh, compared with the uh, expectation. Okay, so next topic is the, about the liquid xenon, uh, MEG2 uh, liquid xenon detector. And uh, this, uh, actually, the uh, MEG2 experiment already uh, started uh, physics data taking last year. And uh, this uh, MEG2 experiment, we look for a mu2e gamma decay. And the gamma uh, ray is uh, detected by a liquid xenon uh, gamma ray detector. <coughs> and uh, this uh, poster uh, mainly uh, discuss about the uh, timing resolution of the uh, liquid xenon detector, but uh, also including this uh, other energy and uh, position uh, the, uh, performance are also de described. <coughs> Okay, so uh, this top poster shows the uh, liquid hydrogen target to fully characterize the new MEG2 liquid xenon calorimeter. And uh, to calibrate this uh, liquid xenon detector, the 
most important calibration will be the uh, lic uh, liquid hydrogen target plus a pi minus beam, uh, which produces a charge exchange reaction and the pi zero calibration. Uh, pi zero will decay into uh, two gammas. And uh, this, uh, if we select the back-to-back -back gammas, uh, then uh, uh, 55 MeV gammas can be used, which is very close to the signal energy of the 52.8 MeV. So this is a very important calibration. And uh, this poster describes the uh, hydrogen target preparation. And this actually is the, uh, this uh, charge exchange reaction calibration was already done last year. And uh, this hydrogen target was uh, successfully operated during uh, last year. So this uh, describes the, uh, the design of the hydrogen target uh, and uh, along with the uh, stable operation. And uh, this uh, <coughs> slide, uh, Poster shows the, uh, the uh, liquid uh, large calorimeters, uh, the possibility for the uh, uh, rather uh, future uh, precision physics <coughs> by using these uh, large crystals and uh, to uh, get the uh, ultimate uh, energy resolution and so on. And uh, currently, this uh, lantern bromide and uh, or uh, LYSOs are uh, uh, investigated and uh, this. Uh, Simulation and uh, with the, also the uh, prototype test was already done and uh, uh, this uh, possibility for the future uh, experiment is uh, under investigation. Okay, so uh, I uh, move on to the uh, remaining two topics about uh, uh, other calorimetry uh, applications. So first is the, uh, looking for a Cherenkov light in the liquid xenon uh, with the uh, light uh, only liquid xenon. <coughs> So this project will try to disentangle uh, scintillation light and uh, Cherenkov uh, radiation in a uh, liquid xenon. And uh, if we can uh, uh, detect both uh, scintillation light and the Cherenkov uh, radiation, for example, the, uh, for NEXO experiment, uh, we may be able to uh, distinguish the uh, background uh, from the uh, 2E uh, signal from the uh, uh, 1E uh, background, because uh, if we, for example, select the uh, direction by using a Cherenkov light, uh, this can be uh, distinguished. So to check this, uh, both uh, scintillation and uh, liquid xenon uh, scintillation light, uh, these uh, filters are uh, prepared in front of the uh, CPMs. And uh, one is uh, only to select the uh, liquid xenon scintillation light, like uh, 175 nanometer. And for a Cherenkov light, uh, long uh, pass uh, <coughs> uh, filters are used to select uh, larger than uh, 220 uh, nanometers. And uh, the very preliminary result already shows uh, some uh, excess of the uh, non uh, liquid xenon scintillation light, and uh, this will be approved by a more uh, sophisticated uh, test uh, chambers. Okay, so I think this is the uh, last uh, application, and uh, this will uh, tell us the uh, study of the CPMs for uh, calorimetry applications. And this is also a uh, rather general uh, purpose, and uh, by using uh, this uh, electromagnetic calorimeter by, uh, laid out by uh, different uh, light guide <coughs> uh, styles and also the uh, PMTs and uh, different uh, CPMs. And uh, to get the uh, best uh, performance of the, uh, for example, uh, light yield and uh, uh, e efficiency and, uh, and so on. So different uh, materials will be uh, tested for this uh, application. Okay, so let me summarize this uh, summary. So a uh, higher granularity, a better timing resolution, and radiation tolerance, and the readout electronics are essential for higher luminosity to ensure a good performance. And calorimetry uh, plays a central role, and not only for the uh, Crider experiment, but also for the uh, intensity frontier experiment. So uh, uh, let's uh, go to the uh, poster session. I think uh, the time is re uh, rather limited, but uh, yeah, uh, let's. Uh, if you are interested in, uh, you can just uh, go there. And uh, yeah, this is the uh, end of this uh, session. But uh, yes, so thank you very much for uh, joining this uh, session. Thank you. And I'm pretty sure uh, you have uh, some uh, information. Yeah, just a short announcement. So yeah, now there is some time to go to the poster session. And then uh, for people who go to Pianosa, 
the bus is leaving at 11.30 from the usual spot up here where the buses are leaving. The other excursions, the people uh, have lunch here and then just, uh, leave for the excursion after lunch. And we reconvene tomorrow. This, the posters will remain uh, uh, in for, for the full afternoon.